Hello and welcome to the ultimate survival guide for beginners. Now, Jakey, you're not a beginner. You speedrun all the bosses. Well, this is true, but also in this run, I'm going to pretend that I am a noob. Now, first, I need to explain what this guide is going to contain. Well, it's going to contain just about everything for a beginner, so someone new to the game, to survive an entire year and don't starve together, and to survive indefinitely. So first, I will say this game is lots of fun when you have no idea what you're doing. But if you're sick of dying, then you can watch this video and you'll know how to not die. Now, now, I'm going to make three different survival guides for beginners, intermediates, and advanced. This one is for beginners, so I'm assuming that all you want to do is survive. You don't want to kill bosses that you don't have to, and yeah, you just want to survive. And so rather than just giving you tips and telling you what to do, I played through an entire year pretending I was a beginner. So I'm following a few rules, like not killing bosses that I don't have to, and my main goal is just surviving and doing things that make surviving a little bit easier. And I'm not doing things that are too hard. So that is why the video is so long, because we're going to be watching through an entire year and I'm going to commentate over the top of it to tell you what I'm doing and why. Now before we jump into the game there's a few settings that we need to change. So the most prominent one is lag compensation. If you want to be able to dodge enemies very well you need to turn lag compensation off. What this does it shows you where your character really is whereas if you have lag compensation on your computer just kind of guesses where your character is so you might take a hit from an enemy when it looks like you shouldn't have taken a hit from an enemy. Also just get familiar with the controls so WASD to move, E and Q to rotate your camera, F to attack, and spacebar to interact with items such as picking things up. Also, you might want to change the backpack layout to integrated. This puts your backpack below your inventory rather than to the side of your screen. And lastly, we're definitely going to want to disable distortion and screen shake. Now, distortion makes your screen all distorted when you're insane, which is really annoying to look at. And screen shake shakes your screen whenever there's like a boss or an earthquake. And it's just completely unbearable. It shakes your screen so much. Now, let's talk about mods very briefly. I'm not a fan of mods that make the game easier. So, if you install some mods, just be careful. Make sure you're not relying on them or anything. But saying this, I do have some mods that I would recommend. In the description, there is a link to a collection of mods that I use sometimes. But the main one that I think everyone should use is geometric placement and snapping tills. It makes placing structures nice and easy, and it makes farming a little bit easier. So, it all starts with the world. So, I'm going to be using default settings, because that's what everyone will probably use. And as as for mods, I'm only going to be using a few client mods, all of which just mute annoying sounds or get rid of some user interface which gets in the way. All of the mods are linked in the description. And now we choose the character you want to play. I'm going to pick Wilson because Wilson has no upside to no downsides. So anything that I do as Wilson, you can do with any character. So ultimately, you should pick the character that you enjoy playing the most. But if you're still not sure, I would recommend either Wilson, Wendy, Willow. Because they're all pretty generic characters except Wendy and Willow have their own basically self-defense systems. So the day has started and I luckily found some gears on the floor so we're only going to grab one just for an ice box later. A tip in the early game is just avoid fighting because fighting is a quick way to die. Now since you're a beginner you don't know how to avoid dying. You have three status bars in the top right. The heart is health. If health hits zero you will die. The yellow one is hunger. If hunger hits zero you will start starving which causes you to take damage and eventually you'll die once you run out of health. Now the brain is sanity. If you run out of sanity, you don't die, but shadow creatures will start spawning if you get to low sanity. And these shadow creatures can attack you, do damage, and therefore could kill you. So ultimately, what does this mean? It means while you're running around, the things that you absolutely need is a light source to keep darkness away, a weapon to fight anything so that they don't kill you, some armor so that you don't take as much damage, and some food so that you can heal and not starve. So if you ever feel like your inventory is quite clogged up with too many items, just remember you only need four items to make sure that you don't die, which are the four that I just previously mentioned. I'm killing some butterflies because if I do take some damage, butterflies heal for eight health, which is like very good early game healing. You need twigs, grass, and flint to do a lot of basic things in the game. So generally, you want a full stack of twigs and grass, which is 40 of each. And flint is used to make tools, which you'll need to do everything basically. Otherwise, we're gathering food so that we can eat that when our hunger drains. And with a normal character, your hunger drains at a rate of 75 points per day. For comparison, 75 hunger points
points is the same as eating six carrots. And hey look, we found Chester straight away, that's nice. Chester is basically a portable chest and we will be exploring for the first like eight, nine days of this world. So he'll be nice for extra inventory slots. And hey look, a wormhole. So if you find a wormhole, jump through it. They'll basically teleport you to another part of the map. If you find one really good wormhole, like a wormhole that takes you to the other side of the map, you can just base near that wormhole and then you have access to the other side of the map. But we're gonna discuss base location later when I actually place down my base. Now this particular wormhole took me to a desert. I can tell that it is the dragonfly desert because the cactus are more round. And in this dragonfly desert, there are tumbleweeds that spawn, which is really good for giving grass and twigs. And they also have a rare chance of giving you other things like gears, gems. So if you come across the dragonfly desert, just go around the edge of it because that's where tumbleweeds will get stuck. Search the tumbleweeds, you'll get lots of grass and twigs and probably get at least one gear. Also, while you're exploring in the early days, if you see seeds on the floor, make sure to pick them up. Farming in this game with seeds is really good. It's one of the best ways to get food, so make sure you pick up seeds. The way seeds spawn is when birds fly away, they have a chance to drop some seeds. Now here, I spotted a boss. We're not going to be killing this boss in this run, don't worry. We are beginners, so we're not going to kill bosses. Here is our first instance of combat. So as you can see, I did two hits and then I dodged. So I was pretty confident I wasn't going to get hit. With most enemies, you can get in one or two hits, then dodge, but it changes for each enemy, so you should just experiment. But in general, avoid combat until you have armor. So gold is one of the other essential things that we're looking for. You can always tell whether a rock is going to drop gold because it has gold veins flowing through it. Wait a second, do you see that little arrow on my sanity meter? That arrow indicates that my sanity is slowly draining, but why is my sanity slowly draining? It's because if you look at the clock in the top right, it's evening time. So in Don't Starve Together, there are day and night cycles. The yellow indicates daytime where you have no sanity drain. The evening gives you a little bit of a sanity drain and at night time you get the same sanity drain and it turns dark. And if you stay in the darkness, first of all, you can't see anything. And second of all, you will be attacked by Charlie. Charlie does a lot of damage if you stay in the darkness for too long. And you can tell when she's gonna attack you because she'll make a really loud scream and then hit you for a bunch of damage. So what does this mean? This means that you always need light. The most basic form of light is a torch. A torch is just, you can make it with two grass and two twigs and you just carry it around and it is enough to keep away Charlie. So I see a lot of new players make camp campfires and sit around the campfire all night. This is kind of a bad use of time because you're just sitting there not doing anything. So it's way cheaper to make a torch because you don't need logs and you can just continue exploring at night. So yeah, make a torch and continue exploring at night. And in this run, I actually only use a campfire once and I don't even use it for light. Another tip is don't be afraid to light trees on fire. Trees respawn naturally, and so you burning down a couple of trees isn't a big deal. And trees burn for a long time, so as you can see here, it, it's providing a massive radius of light for free because I'm not using up my torch. But be careful, fires in this game do spread, so if you're going to set fire to a tree, set fire to a tree that isn't close to any berry bushes or anything else that you don't want to burn. And hey, good job, you survived your first night! So we have twigs, grass, flint, gold, and the next things we wanted to find are pigs. And here we found a nice pig village. Pig Pigs can generally be found in any kind of forest or the deciduous forest which has an orange turf that we'll see later. You can tell what kind of biome you're in by looking at the turf under you. So a light green turf is usually a grassy biome which is very friendly, there's usually lots of food and not a lot of enemies. The forest turf will have spiders and pigs and we'll talk about more biomes in when we encounter them. So I chopped down a couple trees to make a science machine and as you can see there are a bunch of new recipes that I just unlocked. So I made a backpack and a shovel. Backpack just gives you more inventory space but it takes up your body. Slot. So we're going to chop down a few more logs and we're going to make a log suit. This is your first piece of armor. This piece of armor will reduce any physical damage you take by 80%, but the armor itself does have a certain amount of health, so eventually it will break and you can tell because it has durability. Now, let's talk about some pigs. So the reason why you want to smash down these pig houses is they give a lot of good resources which basically speed up the early game. To smash down a pig house you just need to make a hammer which requires 3 rocks, 6 grass and 3 twigs. Here's some turkeys spawned. If you drop one berry on the ground that will make the turkeys ignore you and try to go for the berry. So it's a really easy way to kill them because while they're distracted with the berry you can just hit them twice with your spear. Pigs don't get mad at you for smashing down their houses but if you attack one pig all of them will get angry at you and all of them will attack you. But pigs Pigs don't like darkness, so as soon as the evening starts, the pigs will go home so you can fight them one at a time. So here I beat down a butterfly and I got some butter! Now butter heals for 40 health, so you know, if you're damaged, save that butter for later. It also 
takes a very long time to spoil. Now let's talk about spoilage real quick. You can tell an item that can spoil because you can see the background of that item is green. Once it gets stale, you get less nutrition from the food and you can tell it's stale because it will be called stale and the background will be yellow. And when the food is spoiled, you'll get not a lot of nutrition at all and it will reduce your sanity when you eat it. This is another point which I see players trip up on. You should only gather like what you need. A lot of people will waste time gathering too much of a resource, like cutting down way too many trees than you'll ever need to use. As you've seen, I've only cut down like three trees. But anyway, the reason why I'm burning down this forest is because when you chop down a burnt down tree, it gives you charcoal. And charcoal, you need to make a crock pot. A crock pot is essential. If you don't use a crock pot, you're not going to survive very long. A crock pot gives you access to a bunch of food recipes, which are very good for hunger, healing, and sanity. So yeah. We want about a stack of charcoal, so 40 charcoal. And one tree gives anywhere between one and two charcoal, sometimes three. And you saw there for a split second, I took a little bit of fire damage. So if you stand next to a fire for more than like one or two seconds, you'll start taking fire damage. Uh, this is noteworthy because fire damage stacks. As in, if there's like 10 burning objects near you, you take 10 times the damage. So um, yeah, don't stay near fire for too long. Now, um, as you can see, the outside of my screen is glowing orange. Now, usually you naturally overheat during summer, but because there's so many burning trees around me, I'm actually overheating already. If you overheat too much, you start slowly taking damage. But it's autumn, so the world temperature is not very hot and also not very cold, so you shouldn't take any overheating or freezing damage. Now, I'm gonna pop my armor on because it's evening time, so it's time to fight pigs one at a time. So pigs sometimes run away from you, but if they start running away from you, just stop chasing them and then chase them again. As you can see, I'm doing two hits and then I dodge. And there we go, just like that. But in case I mess up, I have the armor there to tank 80% of the damage like I said before. If you attack a pig with other pig houses around, you can imagine the pigs as looking out their window because as soon as you break their house, they'll be angry at you and start attacking you. And that's because from inside of their house, they saw you attack a pig, so therefore they are aggressive to you. So you can break down the house. If you're quick, you can hit them once and then dodge, but just to be safe, just dodge their attack, do two or three hits, then dodge again. And don't forget your armor. Now that we have destroyed all of the pig houses uh, in this little forest, we're going to pre-craft a crock pot. Now I'm going to explain what pre-crafting is real quick. So as you can see, a crock pot is a structure, but I just spent the materials to make it, but I didn't place it. And you can cancel placing a structure just by crafting it and then right clicking. This basically stores the structure in your crafting tab until you want to place it. And I made two electrical doodads so that I could pre-craft an alchemy engine. An alchemy engine is like an upgraded version of the science machine and you need a science machine to make the alchemy engine. And now it's night time, but I want to fight, so I'm gonna light something on fire and then kill this piggy. And then we're gonna collect up all of the charcoal. And just like that, we have a stack of charcoal. And are you collecting your seeds? Now here I find a living tree, so we're just gonna chop it down. This gives you a special kind of logs which you need for some magic recipes, which we will be using later. So we chop it down for two logs and then use your shovel to dig up the third log. Now here, let's practice some fighting versus some spiders. Now in, you can see that this spider nest is very small, so you can actually stun lock a spider. So if you just keep attacking a spider, it will never attack you. But when there's multiple, you do need to dodge. And if you don't want to fight more, more than one spider at a time, what you can do is simply stand on the edge of the nest to aggro one spider out of the nest, and then lead the spider away from the nest and then kill it. Because if you fight the spiders on top of their nest, all of the spiders inside the nest come out and attack you. Now since we're beginners, we're not going to be going to the ruins this autumn, so we have to dig up graves because graves give you a lot of good things. It can give you gears, nightmare fuel, but most importantly, red and blue gems. It can also give you trinkets, which are like the weird little toys which we can collect and give to the pig king later for a lot of gold. But be warned, every time you dig a grave, it drains your sanity. But don't worry, since soon I'm going to show you an option to restore your sanity. Now here, put on my armor, I start attacking spiders. Now if you look, I have five spiders coming at me. But you can see, when they launch their attacks, their hits register right at the end of their animation. So right as they're finishing their animation, I step back just a little bit, just to get out of range, and I didn't take any hits. Now there is a reason we're killing spiders. So one, they drop monster meat, which is very easy meat, which you can use in the crock pot. And spiders can drop silk, and when you destroy their nests, they also drop silk. Also, later on in the game, if you have a forest full of level 3 spider nests, it becomes, like, very dangerous. So we're clearing them out now when it's easier. Now if you've watched my speedruns, you know what we're looking at just 
first there. Those are guard pigs, which are basically normal pigs, but twice as hard because they attack faster and they are guarding a chest which has the terrarium in it. The terrarium spawns a boss, but like we said, this is a beginner's guide, so I'm not going to be fighting bosses unless I need to fight them, so we're going to ignore it. Now, how many pig houses should you destroy? I like to have two stacks of boards and two stacks of cut stone, which is 10 in each stack, so 20 boards and 20 cut stone, which totals 10 pig houses, but you also use some of those materials to make an alchemy engine, so in total, you're going to be hammering around 12 or 13 pig houses. And did you see that? I got hit by a piggy! Good thing I was wearing armor, so I only took 6 damage. So I ate a butterfly to restore that health, and we're good to go. Now here I'm just doing some nighttime foraging. Oh good, I got surprise attacked by a frog! And to take revenge on the frog, I ate his legs raw. Now as you can see, I took 10 damage from that frog, and I took all of the damage, so my armor didn't absorb any of it since I wasn't wearing it. Also, this is a good time to mention, if you eat raw meat, you lose 10 sanity because it's raw, but otherwise it's the same as cooked meat. So you get the same health and hunger, but you just lose 10 sanity. But there's no reason to cook the meat now since we can eat all of the berries and carrots we've been collecting, which have no penalty for eating them raw. Now, generally, following the cobblestone path is a pretty good direction to go, because the cobblestone path will usually lead you to Chester, the pig king or a pig village or all three of them in my case i found all three of them on the cobblestone road now here i see a bunch of little bunnies so i placed it on my science machine because we need to catch four bunnies so to catch the bunnies what you can do is just place down a trap place the trap a bit far away from the rabbit's hole then stand on the opposite side of the hole to where your trap is and then use your shovel to dig up the hole this will force the bunny to come out and he'll run straight into the trap now bunnies can run through traps if you're too close bunnies do try to run away from you so you can use that behavior to push them into your traps. Now the reason we needed four bunnies is to make a Presti Hattitator. A Presti Hattitator is a science machine but for magic. Yes there's magic in this game and you need to be a science machine to make a Presti Hattitator. So here I made two top hats with the silk that I had. One to make a Presti Hattitator with the four bunnies that we collected but if you wear a top hat it will slowly regenerate your sanity. It will regenerate your sanity enough that you don't lose nor do you really gain a lot of sanity. Now you may have seen a few of these sinkholes around the world. It's time to break one open. So I'm going to put my armor on and get ready to fight with my trusty axe because my spear broke. So kill the basilisks. Don't worry if they hit you because you're wearing armor. And also see that there. I killed that mole one because they steal rocks. So if you drop rocks near your base, make sure there's no mole worms. Otherwise they'll steal it. But anyway, let's jump down the sinkhole and see what we find. So hopefully the first thing you'll see are these light flowers. All we came here for is for two light bulbs. So that alchemy engine we pre-crafted earlier, we're going to put that down, then we're gonna pick up some seeds, light a tree on fire, and now it's time to do some more crafting. So we're gonna make a ham bat, this is why we grabbed at least two meats from killing those pigs. This is a very good weapon which has infinite durability, but the older it is, the less damage it does, but it's still very good. Then we're gonna use a rope and a pigskin to make a football helmet in the fighting tab. This also gives you 80% damage reduction, but it goes on your head, whereas a log suit goes on your body. So now you have two forms of protection in case you don't want to unequip your backpack. And I also make two ropes so that I can craft a lantern. So this will be our light source for the majority of the uh, the majority of the playthrough. Then we're going to smash down the alchemy engine because we don't want to leave it here. And we're going to make another electrical doodad and then pre-craft the alchemy engine one more time. Again, this is just to get rid of the ingredients to free up some inventory space. Now it has just started raining. This is normal in your first autumn. It will rain a little bit for not very long. So don't worry about crafting any kind of rain protection like an umbrella because the rain should stop pretty fast. We'll talk more about rain protection in spring. Also here is a touchstone. These have pig heads near them. If you hammer the pig heads you get two pig skin and two twigs. And also if you die you turn into a ghost and then you can haunt this touchstone and it will revive you but then it breaks so you can only use it once. Usually you have like two touchstones per world so make sure you remember where they are. Now if you're strapped for gold this is the mosaic biome. You can tell it's the mosaic biome because it has a mismatch of a bunch of different turfs. There will be no turf which is that kind of pale looking round. There will be grass turf. There will be forest turf. There will even be swamp turf and in this biome there's a meteor field and there's always gold rocks in that meteor field and then hey look at the end of the cobblestone bath we found pig king you can give pig king all of your toys that you collected all of those trinkets from digging up the graves like spoons and plugs and he'll give you some gold. The heck is this? So these are fire hounds. This is a rare set piece where there will be five sleeping fire hounds surrounding a fire staff. If you pick up the fire staff, it will start raining and all of the hounds will wake up and attack you. Um, but here, pigs are naturally aggressive towards all hounds. So the pigs just went in and started attacking all the hounds. So, you know, I'm picking up the red gems and the monster meat. And hey, look, a wormhole. Let's jump on through it. Now, spoilers. 
this is where we're going to set up my base. Not because Bee Queen is sitting right there, who we're not going to fight, but because if we have a wormhole to the other side of the map and we have a sinkhole right next to that wormhole. So here I'm checking out the map because I'm like, damn, this is a really good place to base. Let's talk about base location now. You can base in basically any biome except biomes that have meteor fields. This is because when a meteor shower happens, if it hits your structures, which it eventually will, it will break them so it's just like a bad place to base. So that's the mosaic biome and any other meteor fields. So where I choose to base is I always want to be next to a sinkhole, always. Second, I want to have a, a good wormhole next to me. If there are no good wormholes next to me, then I just want to base roughly in the middle of the map. That way I can get to everything on the map uh, in relatively fast time. Time to steal some more pig houses. <laughs> And here we found Glomma's statue and the pan flute. A pan flute is an item that when you blow on it, it will put all the mobs around you to sleep. And one pan flute always spawns next to Glomma's statue. So right now I put down another alchemy engine so I could pre-craft an ice box to get rid of the uh, gears that I had in Chester. So now I have an extra inventory space to do whatever I want with. One neat thing with a lantern is you can drop it on the floor and then it stays on while it's on the floor. So that frees up your hand slot. So now I can use a hammer to beat down the house and then fight the pig while staying inside of the light radius of the lantern. And here we we just found the other desert in the world. This is the oasis desert. You can tell because there's a big oasis right there. During summer, that little pond fills up with water. And so I'm looking at the map because the wormhole I just jumped through was close to the last wormhole, which led here. So this world is actually really good. Now next to my base, there is a forest and there was some spiders and pigs having a bit of a war. So uh, I took advantage of the carnage and got some more resources. Another good tip in this game is the mobs usually like to kill each other. So you can usually just stand back and watch them kill each other. And then you just take all the good stuff once they're done fighting. And here, you can actually feed pigs some meat and they'll become your friends for a short amount of time, not forever. And so these pigs will attack whatever you attack and if you get hit by something, they will defend you from whatever you get hit by. So I'm just going to use them to help me kill some spiders while I'm chopping down this living tree. So I'm basically ready to base. I just need some reeds. And reeds can only be found in the swamp, which we have just found. The swamp is probably the most dangerous biome in Don't Starve Together, or at least on the surface. In the ground, there are hidden tentacles, and these tentacles hit for 34 damage, but they hit twice, so they hit you for 68 damage. So a general rule of thumb is if you're ever in a dangerous situation with a lot of mobs around you, just put on some armor. So here, I took off my top hat and put on a football helmet. In case this tentacle hits me by accident, rather than taking 68 damage, I'll only take 13 or 14 damage. Now, what is this? What is this? A tentacle spike? So a tentacle spike has 100 uses, and it hits for 51 damage, uh, every strike. So it's a weapon. A hand bat that is completely fresh does 59 damage for comparison. So a tentacle spike is pretty it's pretty good. So the merms in the swamp will kill tentacles if they attack each other. Um, and so if you see a tentacle spike, you may as well pick it up because it's basically a free weapon. Although I will explicitly say it's not worth killing tentacles just to get tentacle spikes. Also, one more tip about the swamp. If you keep moving, like you don't stop, then you basically can't get hit because the tentacles that come out of the ground are like too slow. Here's a little tip with spider nest. If you walk right on the edge of a spider's web, it doesn't trigger the spiders to come out. Although Chester never walks on the edge of the spider web, so he will always trigger spiders if he walks past them. Gosh darn swamp. All right, now that we have our 12 reeds, we're going to leave and never come back. Uh-oh, did I ever tell you? When you jump through wormholes, it drains a little bit of your sanity. And look, my screen has little red veins over the edges. This means I have gone insane. My sanity has dropped so low that shadow creatures have spawned and now are able to attack me. So with shadow creatures, you can get one one hit in, then dodge their attack, then get another hit in. But a safer way to dodge shadow creatures is to bait out an attack, so wait for them to attack you, then step back to dodge the attack, then hold F, because every time you hit a shadow creature, they teleport, and there is a small chance that they could just teleport right on top of you, so if you hold F, you'll get some extra hits in. Now, dodging attacks like this is called kiting, so now I'm gonna refer to it as kiting for the rest of the video. So now I'm gonna kite bees. Bees are kind of odd. Bees attack range is extremely small, so you only have to step back a little bit right as they try to attack you. And the reason I'm killing this bee's nest is because I want to base here and the bees are in the way. Every time you destroy a beehive, it gives you a honeycomb. And we're gonna need honeycombs because we're gonna build bee nests of ourselves, but not yet. Also, during spring, all bees in the world turn aggressive, so if they're really close to your base, it's just a pain because they're constantly gonna attack you every day. Speaking of annoying things, every evening some basilisks will come out of every cave entrance in the world. And because I want to base near a sinkhole, it means I'm gonna be dealing with these guys every night. But that's not 
not a bad thing really because basilisks have a pretty good chance at dropping some meat so every night you're basically going to get free meat from these basilisks. Now here if you look you see Wilson say did you hear that? That means a hound attack is about to happen. Really good tip if a hound attack is about to happen you can just jump into a sinkhole and then immediately go back up to the surface and it will cancel the hound attack. If your lantern gets a bit low durability just go down into the caves grab a couple of light bulbs and then put them in your lantern. One light bulb restores about 20% durability so you just need five to fully refill a lantern. I have cancelled the hound attack but you can still hear them barking. This is completely normal. The hound attack has been cancelled and they won't spawn. So now I'm just going to play sped up footage of me building the base. Now I am building the base in a very specific layout and one reason is just because I want the base to look nice but there is actually a good functional reason that I'll tell you later on. So what have we built? We've built six crock pots surrounding a fridge and like I said crock pots can be used to put raw ingredients inside to make recipes which are better than the ingredients you put into them and don't worry later I'll tell you all the best recipes that you can use and a fridge. A fridge you can just put food in and it makes the food spoil twice is slow. We've built a bird trap which we're going to bait with some seeds, that way we can catch a bird. And we have the bird cage which we can put the bird in. Hey, we caught a bird pretty quickly. So when you have a bird in a bird cage, you can feed it meat and when you do that, it will give you back an egg. You can also feed a bird a vegetable to get the specific seed for that vegetable. So if you fed it a carrot, it would give you back a carrot seed. Then we craft a garden rigmajig. Now this is what allows you to start farming. All you have to do is place it on the ground and it will turn that tile of ground into farmable turf. And the garden rigmajig has four uses. So once it's done with one tile, move it on to a next one. And we're going to make a nice square. So a two by two area of farmland. So next I'm making a pitchfork. You can use a pitchfork to dig up turf. And all I'm doing this for is to make the base look a bit nicer. So I'm going to mark out areas where I want to build and mark out other areas where I don't want to build. So in this little area is where I'm going to put all of my stuff so that I can empty out my inventory. So here's the first recipe I'm going to teach you. You need three big bits of meat. So for example, one monster meat, two big meats and one of anything else so for example a carrot that will make us some meaty stew now meaty stew heals you for 12 but most importantly gives you 150 hunger now if you need to heal there are a lot better recipes than a meaty stew so don't make a meaty stew if you just want to heal that will stop me from starving for two whole days but my maximum hunger is only 150 so I need to wait for my hunger to be zero to get maximum effectiveness from the meaty stew also the way I moved food directly from the fridge to the crock pot is all you have to do is hold shift then click on the food that you want to move. And the reason why I built those crock pots very close to the fridge the way I did is because I can interact with every single crock pot while still having the fridge open. And if you build the crock pots too far away from the fridge, that means you have to walk too far and the fridge will automatically close when you get too far away. Now I am building one singular chest because like I said, moleworms like to steal rocks and things that are like rocks, like gems. And also some mobs like pigs eat pig skin. So you don't want to leave them lying around the floor because they can easily get eaten or stolen. So those are the items I'm gonna put inside this chest. And now because I am noob, we're gonna build a fire pit right here. So when winter comes and we're at the base, we'll use this fire pit to warm up. Though I will say, use your lantern just during the night because it's not worth wasting logs to fuel the fire pit when you can just use light bulbs for light to fuel your lantern. So now it's time to set up some kind of food farm. So we're gonna make a net with some silk, rope and twigs and we're gonna start catching some butterflies and some bees. So to make our own bee boxes, we need two boards, four bees and one honeycomb. And when I say four bees, the red bees don't count. The red bees are killer bees, you need the yellow bees. And when you catch a bee, the beehive that that bee belongs to, all of the remaining bees in the beehive will get angry at you and uh, they'll come chase you. But they're pretty easy to dodge because their attack range is so short. In fact, you can run straight through bees and they won't hit you because their attack range is so short. And no, you can only really do this during the day because that's when bees come out of their hives and butterflies also only spawn during the day. There is some ways you can force the bees to leave their hive during dusk and night, but it's not worth it. We'll just catch bees during the day. And there it is, the bee box. Our first one has been pre-crafted. Now I hope you are collecting those seeds because now it's time to plant them. So plant around half of the seeds that you have. So if you have two stacks of seeds, plant a whole stack of them. Then we're going to build ourselves a nice watering can so we can put water in this and we can water our plants to make them happy. Because 
If you make plants happy enough, they'll give you back seeds along with the vegetable that grows. This way you can sustainably farm because you use one seed and then you get back a vegetable and one seed. So you basically get a free vegetable. Now we're gonna take out this killer beehive because killer beehives only have killer bees in them but they also give you some honeycomb. So we're gonna use that to make some more bee boxes. Now whatever you do, don't use the hammer on this gigantic beehive right here. If you do that, you will spawn the bee queen who is a raid boss with way too much HP and you need to have... <laughs> And we, and like she's pretty damn hard, so we're not gonna be killing her in this run. Look at this. Oh, pretty much zero hunger. Fully refilled my hunger. That's what you save the meaty stew for. So now we're gonna water the plants, and I also crafted a one-man band, which requires pigskin, nightmare fuel, and some gold. You can make that at your Presta Hatitator, and what that does for farming, it just tends to all of the plants in a small radius around you. It means that you don't have to talk to all of the plants individually. That takes quite a bit of time, and doing this makes the plant happy. Therefore, we're gonna get some seeds back. If you want to know more about farming, I don't have a guide, but James Bucket has a very, very quick and comprehensive guide that covers everything about farming, which I will link in the description. Now, when your old ham bat gets a little bit too rotten, just make a fresh new one. We have plenty of meat and pig skin to keep making ham bats until later when we upgrade our weapons. So now let's place the bee boxes. Now, I won't lie, I made a bit too many bee boxes. Two or three bee boxes per player in your world is like enough, but I ended up making six, and as you'll see by the end of the run, I had like way too much honey. It's also very important to plant butterflies around your bee boxes because how fast your bees create honey depends on how many flowers are around them. So for every bee box, plant like five or six flowers and that should be enough. And you can plant flowers by catching butterflies and then planting them. Now here I spot a mole worm. I don't want mole worms stealing my rocks. So I kill the mole worm, then I dig up its burrow. This permanently removes that mole worm from the world. If you just killed the mole worm and didn't destroy its uh, burrow, it would respawn in the burrow after two and a half days. It's nighttime, but it's not dark. What does this mean? It is a full moon. So we're gonna catch a firefly. Fireflies do appear on every night, but I just happened to catch one on this night. We're gonna use that firefly in a recipe for later, a crafting recipe. And now we go to Glomer's statue and we can find Glomer. Now I always get Glomer just cause he's kinda cute and he can he only appears on the night of full moons. Uh, so just gr grab his flower from his statue and then Glomer will follow you. Glomer can be useful because every few days he will poop and his poop heals you for 40 health, a little bit of hunger, but reduces your sanity by 50. So with 12 grass we make a straw hat and then with the fireflies and one gold nugget we're gonna make a minor hat. This is like a lantern, but for your head. So now we both have a handheld light source and a head gear light source. This is useful because you can equip the miner's hat while holding a tool so you can like work during the night without having to drop a lantern. And you can also refuel the miner's hat in the same way you refuel a lantern by using light bulbs on it. Now, like I said, bees become aggressive in spring. So I'm gonna pick these flowers that are close to my base because bees are attracted to flowers. While I'm being chased by the angriest horde of bees you've ever seen, we're gonna dig up 17 saplings and 17 grass tufts. Why such a specific amount, uh, just because it makes the base look nice. So once we plant these saplings and tufts at our base, they will take some time to grow, but then we'll have our own supply of grass and twigs. Just thought I'd show you a quick example of using the miner hat. See, I don't have to drop any lantern and the light travels with me because I'm wearing the light. So I am planting these uh, saplings very specifically. So if you want to know the pattern, this is the pattern at which I plant these saplings. And for the grass tufts, it's exactly the same as the saplings, but just mirrored. And there is the final bee box that I create in this run. Like I said, this is a bit too many bee boxes. You don't need this many, but it doesn't hurt to have too many bee boxes. You just get more honey than you'll need. Now, how often should you harvest your bee boxes? Good question. Assuming that you've built your bee boxes somewhat close to your base, but not too close, harvest them every three or four days. Now, after planting the saplings, they will start to immediately grow. But for grass tufts, you need to fertilize them with either poop, or rot. So make sure you pick up any guano, manure, or rot that you see on the floor to fertilize your grass tufts. If you're struggling with all the poop, then uh, if you find some beeflo, beeflo will occasionally poop, but they won't poop more than twice in one area. So as you can see, there was only two or three bits of poop here, but as soon as you pick it up, they'll start pooping again. Now, poop is not what I have in mind for this beeflo. I fed him some grass so that he would follow me. <laughs> follow me to his death. So as you can see, I'm gearing up, and once he is far enough away from his fellow beeflo herd, I'm going to attack. So to fight B Flow, you want to do six hits and then dodge. You can do seven hits if you time it very well, but six hits is safer. So the reason I fed him grass before attacking him is to pull him away from his herd, because much like other 
mobs, if you attack one beefalo and there are some other beefalo nearby, all the beefalo will chase you. And you don't really want to fight more than one or two at a time. Now I like to live life on the edgier side, so you know, I fed two beefalo, so I'm about to fight two at once. So as you can see, they're both attacking at the same time right now, which means I can get six hits, then dodge. But then immediately, the other beefalo starts attacking a little bit late. So you just have to predict when the beefaloes are going to attack. But to be extra safe, you can just fight one at a time. And that is what we wanted to see, a beefalo horn. So beefalo dropped four meat, three beefalo wool, and they have a chance to drop a beefalo horn. This horn is pretty good because it can make a beefalo hat, which has the highest insulation of any hat in the game. We'll talk more about insulation in winter. So using some gold and some flint, I make a beefalo bell. This is a relatively new update, and what you can do is you can use it on a beefalo, and that beefalo will then follow that beefalo bell. So this is pretty good for like relocating a herd of beefalo, since you can just steal a beefalo from an existing herd and put it somewhat close to your base. It will reproduce more beefalo, and then you can use those beefalo to farm them for meat, or you could use them for hound defense. So we're just going to place the beefalo bell near the cave entrance so that if bats attack the beefalo, the beefalo will kill the bats. And Kobume, with some beefalo fur and a beefalo horn, we've made a beefalo hat. We'll save this for later. So my plant's finished growing, so I'm going to re-till my farming ground and plant a bunch more seeds before winter just to make sure we have enough food. Here's a tip that might not be super obvious. You know all those carrots we were gathering while we were exploring? Yeah, they're about to spoil and I haven't used them yet. And when they spoil, they're just going to turn to rot and they'll be useless. So what we're going to do is feed all of the carrots to the bird and then one carrot gets us one carrot seed. Then we can replant these carrot seeds later on to get back a fresh carrot. And carrot seeds take a lot longer to spoil than actual carrots. Now let's talk about how, how I've placed these beehives. I didn't place them very well because as you can see, whenever you take honey from the bee boxes, bees will come out of the bee box and start attacking you. So there are lots of methods to get around this annoyance, but the simplest one is simply to plant your bee boxes like three to four tiles apart. That way you can run between all of the bee boxes and because bees move quite slowly they won't be able to catch up to you in time by the time you loot the next bee box. Now I found this set piece earlier and I want to steal all of the turf but there are four clockwork knights and one clockwork rook. Luckily for me the clockwork rook if you run the clockwork rook into his fellow clockwork knights uh, then he'll damage them for 200 damage each time. So he only needs to ram into them four times and then they'll die. So rather than risking getting hit and killing the clockwork knights ourselves we're just going to use the clockwork rook to kill them all. But you know just in case I mess up and get hit by the clockwork rook, I am wearing armor. So once I got that done, I finished off the rook myself. Now there's not really an easy way to kite the clockwork rook because he kind of moves very fast, so I'm just gonna tank him. And I have some nice cooked tomatoes to heal all the damage. And then we're gonna steal all the turf. All the turf is mine for my base now. So it's night time and you want some eggs, but your bird is sleeping. If you take the bird out of the cage and then straight back in, you can quickly feed it about five bits of meat before it falls asleep. While the bird is sleeping, you can't feed it eggs, so this is a way around it if you don't want to wait for morning. Now since I killed so many clockworks, I have loads of gears, so I'm going to make a couple more fridges just so I have room for extra food if I need to. I'm also going to build an extra fridge near the bird cage to store seeds in, so the seeds will take twice as long to spoil. And look at the difference, our base looks amazing now with all this brand new stuff stolen turf. So not only are we surviving, but we're also making a very nice looking base, which I like actually kind of like doing. <laughs> There's no point surviving if your base is going to be ugly. Now we're going to teach you a holy recipe, one vegetable, one egg, any meat, and then any filler. So I'm going to use honey here for the filler. And this will make the holy grail of food. It will make pierogies. Now pierogies heal you for 40 health and 37.5 hunger. So basically, if you need to heal, pierogies have got you. Whenever your saplings and grass tufts are grown, make sure you pick them so that they start regrowing again. So in preparation for winter, we're going to make a thermal stone. This requires 10 rocks, one pickaxe, and three flint. For now, we're just going to leave it by the fire pit, and I'll explain what it does when winter actually starts on day 21. For the last little bit of autumn, I decided we're going to make a very small pig farm. So we're going to go find some more pig houses to hammer down, because there are quite a few advantages to a pig farm. The first one, during full moons, pigs turn into were pigs if they are outside. And were pigs always drop one pig skin and two meat, so that's quite a lot of stuff. And also, if we get a hound attack and for whatever reason we don't want to cancel it by going into the caves, we can use the pigs to help kill the hounds, because pigs naturally are aggressive towards hounds. This is a good example of me being quite careless. So you can see both of my armor pieces break. Now luckily I just about escaped, but if I had more spiders on me, they could stun lock me, which means every time your character gets hit, there's a little stagger animation they go through, and if you're getting hit by too many things, you'll constantly be stuck in that stagger animation. So make sure you're always carrying two armor pieces, so if one 
breaks, you have a backup one. So let's start that pig farm. I've made a little walled off area, which I'm going to put some pig skin in. If the pigs are attracted to some food, they will stay outside their houses even when it turns dark. So the idea is I build a bunch of pig houses around this little enclosure and then I put something edible inside the enclosure like pig skin and they'll constantly walk up against the walls. And then when there's a full moon or when there's a hound attack, I can use the pigs or kill the were pigs. It is the night of day 20. That means winter is tomorrow. So we're going to pick up a glomus goop and put that in the fire. Glomus goop counts as a really strong fuel. So it'll put a fire into a really strong state. And while your fire is roaring like this, when the flame's really big, that's the hottest it can get. And therefore it will get your thermal stone nice and hot. Although I will teach you a better method to get your thermal stone hot during winter, but this is fine for the first couple days. I hope you enjoyed autumn because now we're in winter. So the difference between autumn and winter is winter, the temperature of the world goes down and naturally your character's temperature will try to match the world temperature. So if your character's temperature is above the world temperature, your temperature will go down one degree every second, except if you have insulation. If you have insulation like a beefalo hat, the rate at which your temperature goes down will decrease. That's how a beefalo hat helps. And the reason we have a thermal stone is a thermal stone acts as another source of heat. So you can store say 60 degrees of temperature inside a thermal stone and the thermal stone loses heat a lot slower than your character does. So the thermal stone will keep you hot for like an entire day until you need to reheat it again. And there's a very important mob that spawns in winter and only spawns in winter. So I've made four pierogies because we need to get ready to fight. So you see this moonstone right here. The forest that has this moonstone will always have one Mac Tusk camp in it. And you can see on the edge of the map, you can just about tell where the Mac Tusk camp is because the Mac Tusk camp always spawns within the bright green part of the biome. And now we have a quick hound wave. This is the first hound wave we've actually seen because I accidentally cancelled my first one. Hound waves are just a bunch of hounds will spawn in and attack you. And the older your world is, the more hounds that spawn. So at that time, I only got three. Now here's what we need to fight. Put on your armor because you will take some hits because the guy we need to kill hits us with range attack. So it's pretty hard to dodge. And here I got him stuck on the edge of the world, so I managed to kill him. Normally he tries to run away, so you have to chase him down until he turns around and walks back to his camp, at which point you can just keep attacking him. And hey, we got a new hat. We weren't actually going for the Tambo Shanna, we wanted a tusk. This guy will spawn in two and a half days, so we'll have to come back in two and a half days and hopefully get the Mac Tusk, which is a 50% chance to drop. Now, is the Tambo Shanna good? Well, it provides half the insulation that a beefalo hat does, but the Tam O'Shanta restores sanity, 6.6 .6 sanity per minute, which is really good. But since I want nightmare fuel, I'm not gonna try to restore my sanity. And as you saw, I just lit a tree on fire and dropped my thermal stone next to the tree. Now trees burn really hot. So if you drop a thermal stone next to a burning tree or two, it will make the thermal stone super duper hot. Then you can go and do whatever you want, such as mining like I was doing, and then go back and pick up your thermal stone. Now, while you're running near the sea, some pengals can jump out of the sea. And whenever you see that, that means some ice glaciers would have spawned at the pengal nest. So follow the pengals to wherever they're going and you'll find some ice glaciers. These ice glaciers, you can get anywhere between three and nine bits of ice. Ice is really good. Firstly, we need it for a crafting recipe in summer. But secondly, you can use ice as a really easy filler for your crock pot. And while ice is inside of an ice box, it will never ever spoil. So it will be there forever. Now I had a bunch of spare meat that was about to spoil. So rather than letting it go to waste, I'm giving it to the pig king. And every time you give him one bit of meat, he'll give you one bit of gold. So it's a pretty good trade, but he doesn't accept monster meat. But an easy way around this is feed your monster meat to your bird, then you can get eggs and then you can give the eggs to the pig king. Now I know that some people may mention this, so that's why I'm doing it now to give people an example. But if you ever see these suspicious dirt piles in the wild, so after investigating it, it will reveal a paw print which points in a certain direction. If you follow where that paw print points to, and after a lot of searching, your character will eventually say, oh there's something here, or something like that, and bam you might get a koalaphant. If you do get a koalaphant, good job, because they drop eight meat and one koalaphant trunk, which is even better than an entire honey ham when it's cooked. Now, koalaphants run away from you, so it's kind of hard to attack them. The easiest way is wait for nighttime, let them go to sleep, and then attack them during their sleep. Or it's a little bit harder and finicky, but you can get them stuck on the edge of the map like I did there, and then you can attack them. And they're exactly the same as like fighting a beefalo. Do six hits or seven if you're quick, then dodge, and then repeat until it dies. Ignore me being insane, we found some deer. So if you slap one of these deers once, it will run into a tree and you can get its antler. Now you can use this antler to fight a boss, which I will do later, but 
I recommend that you don't, because I underestimated how hard this boss is when you don't have enough speed bonus, but we'll see my struggle later. And for the rest of the run, I'm going to be insane most of the time, so if you're not going to be using a Tamo Shanna, you're also probably going to be insane. If you're a beginner, you probably don't want to fight, but I promise you it's, it's totally worth learning how to fight shadow creatures, because once you can ignore sanity, you save so much resources and time by not keeping your sanity up. And you also need to kill nightmare creatures to get nightmare fuel, so that you can make our new best weapon pretty soon. Now's a good time to mention, you might be running low on flint from all the tools you've used. Now that we have a lot of gold, we can just make golden tools. Golden tools last a lot longer than flint tools, and all they require are four twigs and two gold. If you've seen my boss run videos, you'll be familiar with this strat. So, you can see we're chopping down dead trees pine cones, but not only pine cones. Every time I chop down a tree, including dead trees, I have a small chance to spawn a tree guard. A tree guard drops six living logs. So, we're doing this both for pine cones and living logs. And that is because when the winter boss spawns, we're gonna use him to chop down trees for us and those trees we're gonna plant ourselves with all the pine cones we're getting oh looky there my first tree guard so this is a small tree guard so because he's small his attack range health is lower so with this guy you can do five hits and then dodge whereas with the bigger tree guards you can only do four hits because their range is a bit too big so we're back with a second attempt at the Mac tusk it's been more than two and a half days so he's respawned and if you're quick you can see he does a little aggro animation so you can get quite a few hits on him while he's doing that animation now this kill was kind of weird because I didn't know where his hounds were. Usually you have Mac Tusk which fires blow darts at you. You have Wee Mac Tusk that doesn't actually attack. Wee Mac Tusk does command the two ice hounds. But I don't know where the two ice hounds went. Anyway, as you can see, I just chased Mac Tusk until he stopped running away. And that's a pretty good way of killing him. And we got another Tamu Shanna and a Walrus Tusk. And that's what we wanted. Goodness gracious, I've been jump scared by a really big tree guard. So we're going to put on the armor and we're going to do four hits and then dodge. So I did five hits there and I paid the price and I got hit. So yeah, this tree guard is a little bit too big, so his attack range is a bit too long to do five hits without any speed bonuses. Then moments after, we get a little icky wicky little baby tree guard again. So let's take him out. What the, why can't I have this kind of tree guard luck during my speed runs? Like what the, how many tree guards is that? Like four or five or something? So I'm gonna include an example of being insane while trying to fight something. So here I'm trying to fight the tree guard, but I've gone insane to the shadow creature. So in this scenario, you should just run away from the tree guard and then kill the shadow creature and then carry on fighting the tree guard. Always make sure to wear armor because I took a few hits there from the shadow creature. So now all the pine cones I just gathered, I'm gonna plant in one big long straight line. And that's because we're gonna use the winter boss to knock down all of these pine cones that will grow into trees so we get loads of wood. So right here I'm placing a sign. That is because when Deerclops spawns, the first thing he wants to do is destroy the nearest structure near his spawn. So if I go over near the sign when he's about to spawn, he'll go towards the sign. That way I can find him really easily and it means my base will be nice and safe. With two gold, the tusk and four twigs, we've made a walking cane. This, while you're wearing it, gives you a 25% speed boost, which is huge. So with those red and green gems we got earlier, we're going to make a purple gem and then using the living logs and nightmare fuel we've been gathering, we're going to prototype a shadow manipulator, which is basically an alchemy engine, but for magic. Get rid of the silly Presti Hattata, and we can put down the shadow manipulator. So the reason why I don't need the Presti Hattata or a science machine anymore, because everything you can make with a science machine, you can also make with an alchemy engine, so you don't need both. The same thing applies for a Presti Hattata and a shadow manipulator. And now we have our new best weapon, which is a Dark Sword. Dark Sword does the best damage in the game, 68 per strike, and we can make a lot of them because I have a lot of nightmare fuel and living logs. And now we're making the safe sacred honey ham, one meat, one monster meat, and two honey. You don't have to use monster meat, you can just use normal meat as well, and you only need to use one honey, so you can use two meats, one honey, and one ice. But I have a lot of honey, that's why I'm using two honey. But like I said, honey ham is amazing, 75 hunger and 30 health. So I spent a few days looking for Claus's sack. Now when I was a noob, this was the first boss that I mastered outside of the seasonal bosses, but I hadn't done it with just a walking cane in a very long time, so I kind of underestimated how tough it is. So uh, yeah, let's uh, let's watch me struggle. So Claus is accompanied by two gem deers. So normally his attack pattern is he'll do two swipes. You can do four or five hits. Then he'll do two swipes again. You do four or five hits. And then he'll use a gem deer spell, either fire or ice. And now since I don't have a lot of speed bonuses, I take damage from overheating and from freezing. If you have enough speed bonus, you avoid the spells entirely. So I'm taking damage from those spells. And as you can see, I don't have a lot of food in my inventory. I had extra food in the fridge, but I just didn't bring it because I didn't think I would need it. Now let's speed up the fight until we reach the next phase.
Oh goodness, what's happening? Is he calling for help? These Krampus are very easy to kite when you have enough speed bonus. I do not have a lot of speed bonus, so I'm taking a few hits. Now, you can kite these with just a walking cane. It's just like really hard and I'm not used to it. We all know the real reason. The real reason, I'm just bad at the game. So towards the end, I actually start kiting them properly. You have to switch to the walking cane, otherwise you don't have enough speed bonus to kite them. Anyway, once you deal with the two Krampi, I heal up and I am nearly out of food and we continue the fight. Oh, I have two honey hams left, but you know what? That fight wasn't too bad. You know oh, oh, he's back. Phase two. So in this phase, he pounces, um, which is really bad because if you have just a walking cane, uh, you don't have enough speed bonus to dodge the pounce from up close. So usually with enough speed bonus, you could dodge the pounce at right at the last second. So I have two alternatives. Alternative one is just before he uses the pounce attack, I run really far away so that he can't reach me. Or alternative two is I hide behind the claw's sack that way, he'll pounce into the sack and won't hit me. And at this point, I'm kind of like, hmm, I should probably get some more food. So I'm trying to look for blue mushrooms around the arena, because blue mushrooms, they heal you for 20 health each. I find a clutch blue mushroom just there. So I kind of resort to just pulling claws outside of his normal aggro range. That way, he doesn't pounce at me, since he won't pounce outside of his normal roam range, as you can see. And now, of all moments, I go insane, so now I have to deal with shadow creatures and a pouncing claws. Oh, this fight is just a mess. Now, at the time, this fight seemed like it was taking forever and I was now taking hits because I kept messing up. I had no food and I was constantly taking overheating damage because of the gem deer. But I really didn't, didn't want to leave. I knew Claws is low HP. Luckily for me, if you just walk outside of, if you just go away from Claws, he won't despawn but he will de-aggro for a short time so you can deal with shadow creatures and then get back into the fight. Look at my health! So I make a clutch shovel so I can dig up not a blue mushroom, but a blue clutch room. Because holy moly, my health is so low and I'm insane. Oh, a lifeline, a blue mushroom. Yum, yum, yum. I'm already insane, so it doesn't matter that I'm eating blue mushrooms. If you didn't know, blue mushrooms do heal you for 20, but they also lower your sanity. My goodness, look at my 13 health! <laughs> we did it. Okay, so the only reason this fight went badly is because I didn't realize how much damage I would take from overheating and freezing. So um, if you're going to do this fight as a beginner, bring plenty of armor and bring like 10 or 15 pierogies so you have lots of food. Because that's where I went wrong. You know that koala that we took out? I just cooked it strong and ate it. So that heals you for 40 health and it gives you 75 hunger. Then we're going to open up Claws' presents. Two of them will guaranteed only have charcoal, gold, and maybe a life-giving amulet. One of them might have a Krampus sack, a 10% chance. A Krampus sack is a backpack that has loads of inventory slots and it isn't flammable. And then his last package will have a bunch of random boss loot in it. So here, I got a, I got an extra Deerclops eyeball. Now here's a pretty good tip. If you find a level 3 nest, slowly clear it out like I'm doing now. So bait out a few spiders at a time, make sure you've got armor on, and then once you've killed all the spiders, hit the nest and one spider might pop back out, but kill that one and then finish off the nest. Now a level 3 nest drops silk along with spider eggs. These spider eggs you can plant anywhere you want. So for me, I'm going to plant it somewhat close to my base. Now spiders do roam quite far from their nests during dusk and night, so don't put it too close to your base. Having a spider nest close to your base gives you easy access to monster meat and silk. Something very special happens on the night of day 30, and we're going to need some cactus for it, because we want some sanity. So if you need some quick sanity, pick some cactus, wear some armor, because it does damage you when you pick cactus. Cooked cactus flesh restores 15 sanity and 12.5 hunger. So it's like the easiest sanity food to get hold of. All you have to do is pick it and then cook it. Did you hear that? Um, so if you've never got this far before, this is a spoiler, but on the night of day 30, 
your first seasonal boss will come for you. So this is why we built a campfire and I'm about to pre-build another one to stay warm while Deerclops comes. Now, while we wait for Deerclops to spawn, let me make him a whole lot scarier by explaining how he works. Deerclops will spawn in an area around a player. So right now, I'm the only player, so he will spawn somewhere near me. But when Deerclops spawns, he will target the closest structure to wherever he spawned to. So that is why I have built a sign. Because Deerclops will see the sign, even from a long distance away, and he'll immediately go to destroy it. But as you saw there, Deerclops saw me before seeing the sign, so then he came for me instead. You can tell when Deerclops is aggroed on you because he will scream. But we're not gonna kill Deerclops yet, no no no. Those trees you planted, that's what Deerclops is gonna chop down for us. Once you've ran him through all of your trees, it's time to kill him. Now, you can kite Deerclops, but because you're a beginner, you just want this fight done fast. So we're building a campfire, putting two or three logs in it, then moving away to drop our backpack so that it doesn't catch fire. And now, this is, I made a little bit of a mistake here. You should have, you should now eat all of your cactus to keep your, to put your sunny at max. As you can see, I have a shadow creature attacking me. But anyway, put your armor on, stand near the campfire, eat your cactus when your sanity gets low, and also eat food when your health gets low. The reason why we're stood next to a campfire is because every time Deerclops hits you, he freezes you a little bit. And if he freezes you too much, he will freeze you solid, which stops you from attacking until you get hit. And a campfire warms you back up to, to prevent you from being frozen. So I took a bit of damage there because my campfire set a tree on fire, so I took a bit of fire damage. But anyway, it's worth noting the amount of armor that I brung. So I brought just over one football helmet and I brought two log suits. That'll be enough armor to tank Deerclops. Now, I wouldn't recommend this if you're a beginner, but what I did just here, I decided that I wanted some pigskin and meat. So I lured lit Deerclops towards my pigs and then my pigs came to die against Deerclops. Now, the reason why I wouldn't recommend this is because it's kind of finicky to deal with Deerclops' behavior. Because if he isn't aggroed on, on anything, then he will just try to, to destroy its structures. So I hit Deerclops because I wasn't sure whether he was attacking a building or not. Also, another fun fact about Deerclops, if he's aggroed on you, so if he's trying to hit you, he will not damage structures. But if he's not aggroed on you, that's when he can actually go and destroy structures. But here we go. This is how the fight is meant to look like. Stand near a campfire and fight Deerclops. And you just hold attack, and as long as you have enough armor, you'll be fine. It's also very crucial that you don't stand right on top of Deerclops. So you, you should start attacking him, then you should step back. That way your sanity won't drain as fast as if you stood right, next, right on top of him. But hey, good job, you just killed your first seasonal boss, time to cheer. So I am sorry to say, but Deerclops is legitimately probably the easiest boss in the game. Uh, that is because he attacked quite slowly and he has very low health. Anyway, all those trees that Deerclops knocks down, go pick up all of the logs and the pine cones. The reason why we did this is because cutting down your trees yourself takes so long. You have to hit the tree 15 times with your axe, then you have to dig up the stump with a spade or you can just have Deerclops walk over the top of them. Now it is your second full moon, day 31. You can tell when it's a full moon. It's every 20 days after day 11, so 11, 31, 51. So if the last number of your day count is one, and then the numbers before that are odd, that means it's a full moon. And now I went to kill some goats and a hound attack happened. So I set a spiky bush on fire to keep me warm, and then I killed the hounds. I am also insane at the same time, but these slow shadow creatures are very easy to ignore because they're so slow. I'm kind of getting over overwhelmed by the amount of hounds. So one thing with, with hounds, after every time they try to attack you, they might sit there and bark. When this happens, that means they're re-aggroing. That means they have a chance to attack something around them and that's including you. But ultimately what this means is you can de-aggro hounds just by running around. As you can see, the hounds attacked a vault goat and the vault goats have a lot more HP than the hounds. So the hounds die quite quickly to them. The takeaway here is if you just run around with hounds and there are other mobs around, the hounds will eventually attack the other mobs, leaving you safe to do whatever you want. Anyway, I light another bush on fire because I'm getting a little bit cold. You can tell when your thermal stone is getting cold because it will stop being red and it'll start being yellow. And now it's time to kill some goats. So goats naturally will run away from you, so you either need a ranged weapon to aggro them, or you could just wait for them to go to sleep and then you can attack them while they're sleeping. Be sure not to drop your backpack too close to fires. Right there, my backpack started smoldering. So I killed some goats and I get a vault goat horn. This is what we wanted. Using this horn, we can make a weapon which is very good for spring, which is the next season coming up soon. Also, vault goats are just really good to kill anyway because they drop two meat every time you kill them. And if you do kill goats, please, please, 
please, please leave one of the goats alive. It's because they cannot respawn if all of them are dead. You need to leave at least one alive, then they'll respawn once every two and a half days. So with two electrical doodads, two niter, and one vault goat horn, we're going to make a morning star. Now this weapon is only good if whatever you're fighting is wet. You can tell if something is wet when you're fighting it because their name will be blue and it will start with wet. So for example, wet Chester. So against a wet target, this weapon does a little bit more damage than a dark sword. And while you're wearing it, it also provides light. Its durability goes down the longer you're wearing it, not the amount of hits you do. So try to preserve it as much as you can. Here's something that you'll probably need. Using two hound teeth, eight silk, and a log, you can make a sewing kit. This repairs clothing and thermal stones. And as we'll find out later, there are only some clothes that you can get once per year, so you don't want them to break. In this game, most of the items, when they hit 0% durability, instead of just staying there, they just get destroyed. So you want to repair them. Speaking of important clothing, I just went to the desert to use a hammer on some bones to get some bone shards, and there we go, I made the eyebrella. Standing at the alchemy engine, we can see we can make the eyebrella, which requires four bone shards, 15 twigs, and one Deerclops eyeball, which is what Deerclops drops. This gives you 100% rain protection while you're wearing it. And as you can imagine, in spring, it's gonna rain. But that's not the only thing that happens during spring. Using four gold and one cut stone, we can make a lightning rod. Now we want to place this close to our base. Now when lightning strikes, it, whatever it strikes, it will set it will set things around where it strikes on fire. So if it strikes you while you're standing next to a crock pot, it will set the crock pot on fire. Now generally lightning rods have a range of about two screens, but just to be sure, I built one either side of my base. Since if I'm to the right of the base, the left lightning rod might not work. Now if there's a lightning strike somewhat around my base, the lightning will hit the lightning conductors rather than anything inside the base or me. Now we've jumped down into the caves. Now in the caves, it's always a little bit colder than it is on the surface. And since it's winter, that means it's very cold in the caves. But we're looking for something down here. And there we go, we've found what we're looking for bunny hutches. Now make sure you don't have any meat on you. Much like real vegans, if these bunny men see meat in your inventory or backpack, they will attack you. So yeah, don't have any meat or crock pot recipes that require meat. But fortunately for us, they don't attack you if you hammer down their houses. So we're gonna hammer down exactly four houses. Even if there's more houses, we don't need more than four. So don't worry about knocking down more than four. Then everything their house drops when you hammered it, pick it all up. But don't eat the carrots, we need those. If you need to refill your lantern or miner hat, make sure to grab some light bulbs. Then then head straight back to the surface. Then at the alchemy engine, we're gonna prototype a rabbit hutch. Now this is exactly what we just hammered down, except we're building them on the surface. And the reason why it's handy is because we're gonna place them a little bit away from the base, but above the sinkhole. Because bunnies come out at evening and night. And do you know what else comes out at evening and night? The basilisks that come out of the sinkhole. So now when the evening happens, the bunnies and the basilisks will both come out at the same time, and they'll fight each other. And two bunnies will be able to kill all of the basilisks. Do beware, sometimes the bunnies can roam a little bit into your base and if you have meat they'll get aggressive and attack you but if this happens just dodge hit twice and dodge and now spring is nearly here but i don't have anything to do so um i'm stealing a bunch of rocky turf and cobblestone turf from the mosaic biome remember the mosaic biome is the biome that has the meteors and a bunch of different turfs all in one and the reason why i'm grabbing both rocky turf and cobblestone is because to craft cobblestone you need rocky turf and one plank and why are we making cobblestone it gives you a little bit of a speed bonus but mostly it's gonna look nice in the base the day has finally arrived day 36 will be your first spring and spring Spring is going to last 20 days and as you can see the snow has cleared we can finally see the floor again and my base looks amazing if I do say so myself oh goodness it started to rain now as you can see you have an I now have a wetness meter you can tell how heavy it's raining firstly you can hit you can hear how heavy it's raining but if you look at the wetness meter the arrow right now is very small that means my wetness is going up very slowly and while the rain is very light like this you don't need to wear your eyebrella since it doesn't matter how hard it's raining it will still use up the same amount of durability for your eyebrow umbrella but once your wetness reaches more than five or ten then you should put on your umbrella to dry off because if you get wet that makes all of your equipment wet and you lose an uncomfortable amount of sanity depending on the amount of wet items you have in your inventory and also if you get really wet it lowers your temperature and it can make you drop your tools so anything that you're holding now apart from ice being very good in the crock pot we're also going to use it to make an ice fling mag with two gears two electrical doodads and 15 ice now this little contraption is extremely handy as you can see it has a a radius. Now if anything is on fire or requires hydrating inside of this radius, the flingomatic when it's turned on will fire snowballs at it 
to put the fire out. Now, summer is still 20 days away, but basically, if anything catches fire on our base during summer, we can turn on the flinger mag and it will put out all the fires. So now our base is fireproof. And it's exactly why I said that I built the base the way I did, because now all of the important stuff fits inside of the flinger mag's range. Now, as you can see, it's raining hard, so I'm wearing the umbrella. And as you can see, my lightning rod is glowing. That's because it's doing its job and a lightning strike hit it. And with those planks that I got from those logs from Deerclops, I'm making a few chests. This way I can store all of my items nicely in chests rather than having them all over the floor. You don't want your bees to get struck by lightning, do you? No, no, no. So I made a lightning rod. We're gonna place this near our bees and you'll notice something about our bees. All of them are red. All bees in the world, including your own bees, will become red and aggressive. If at this point you haven't built bee boxes, don't worry. You still can. Even though these bees are red, they are still normal bees. But killer bees do exist and you can't use killer bees in the bee box recipe. And this is exactly why earlier I told you to place the bee boxes a little bit further away from your base to make sure the bees aren't coming into your base and always attacking you. Then I went mining for like an entire day. Then I built a nice second fridge to store all of my vegetable seeds because I had a bit too many. Then I just went ham and built even more fridges because I had the extra gears. And because it's not winter anymore, our grass and our twigs will start growing again. So whenever these have grown back, make sure to pick them for grass and twigs. Now, I did this for demonstration purposes, but if you get desperate, you can eat Glomer's Goop because it, it does heal you for quite a lot, but it also reduces your sanity by a lot. Now, since we have a lot of honey, you can put four honey or three honey in one twig into the crock pot and you can make yourself some taffy. This restores a little bit of sanity and it hurts your health a small amount. Then with the extra turf that we have, I'm going to just turf out the uh, pig farm just to make it look nice. And then what the heck? Are those, are those geese? So here the frogs are doing my work for me, but if you hit one of these these baby geese, they will start screaming and they will call down their parent. Now this is the spring seasonal boss. Now whether you're a beginner or not, I'm sorry, but you need to kill at least one of these. Well you don't need to, but it will make summer a whole lot easier if you get some of their feathers. Now technically we only need five feathers, but in this run I'm actually going to kill all of the muskoos on the map. Yes, you heard right. There are multiple of these things across the map. But where do these muskoos spawn? Well, you can tell where these muskoos are because because there will be a pond surrounded by five berry bushes and three birch nut trees in a very consistent pattern, which you can see on screen now. Also, there will be those weird twig markings on the floor that indicates that there will be a nest there during spring. N without getting too much into the world generation, there are certain biomes that will never ever spawn any muskoos. So both of the deserts, the swamp, and the mosaic biome will never ever have a muskoos nest. So don't go looking in there for a muskoos nest. Now the kiting pattern is very simple. You do three hits and then you dodge. You can get four hits in if you like time it perfectly or you have extra speed bonus, but otherwise three is way safer. Now it's also worth noting that I brought a log suit along with a football helmet. When the big muskoos dies, something kind of crazy happens babies have turned into Tasmanian devils. So after you kill the mother and the babies have no parents, they will turn red, they will grow a little bit in size, and they will chase you and then spin after you. And when they initiate their spin, they can they have a chance at attracting lightning and causing rain to start. This is very handy to know because if it isn't raining, there's a chance that things could stop being wet. So you kind of want to let the babies spin until they force it to rain. Therefore, you can keep using your morning star for maximum damage. This is dangerous if you don't have lightning protection because if a lightning strike hits you, it stuns you in place for two seconds. And if all of the babies hit you at once, that's a lot of damage. What we're going to do is wear the log suit so that we have armor on, but we're also going to wear the umbrella. This way, if we get hit by lightning, we won't be stunned in place, but we still have the armor protection via the log suit. Now, every time you kill a goose, make sure you pick up the feathers, because if lightning strikes on top of the feathers, it can set them on fire. And you don't want that, because that means you can't use them, because they'll get burnt to ash. Also, let's talk about how to dodge the babies. So when they approach you, when they get close enough, they will initiate their spin and they will try to spin directly towards you, which just means you have to walk perpendicular to their spin, which basically just means change your direction right as they spin towards you. And then you should chase them down because once they finish their spin, they get a bit dizzy. So they sit there for a few seconds being dizzy and that's where you can get a few hits in on, on them. As funny as it is, you kind of want to avoid it. When the babies can spin, they can strike themselves with lightning, which will set them on fire. And if any mob in the game dies while they're on fire, all of their drops will be cooked, meaning all of their meat will be cooked, which sounds good, except all the feathers will be burnt to ash, so that's not good. So if there's a baby on fire, just don't hit it, don't risk killing it and burning all the feathers. And like I said, I'm gonna kill all of them on the map, you don't have to kill all of them, since you only need 5 feathers, and generally, one Muskoos family can, will give you about 15 feathers. <laughs> 
Now I thought it was worth mentioning that you can kind of be sneaky with this boss, so if you run away from the Moose Goose at night, she will go to sleep and all the babies will be asleep as well. So during this time, you can kill the babies or get a few hits on the babies to make them weaker. This way, when the mother does die, it makes the second phase less dangerous because all the babies will be weak and or some of them will be dead. Even though they're still babies, so they're not very big, they still drop the same amount of drops. So yeah, so if you want, you can kill the babies at night time. Now here's a great example of when everything goes wrong. So right Right now I'm insane, There are there's, there's a hound attack and there's a moose goose after me and my armor just broke. So now I'm forced to wear my football helmet which means I'm susceptible to rain and lightning but it's worth having armor on even though it exposes me to the elements. So as you can see here, as long as there's a mob such as moose goose around, the hounds will eventually just de you and attack something else. Even though everything kind of went wrong here, I was still pretty safe just because I had that knowledge. What on earth is that? That looks like a weird little alien thing. This is a lure plant. During spring, lure plants can spawn on parts of the map where you have previously visited. So after they spawn, they take two and a half days to grow, but when they do grow, they grow eye bulbs. These eye bulbs provide a massive radius of hostile plants. They're all very weak, but since there's a lot of them, they're pretty dangerous, and they will be aggressive to you. And if the eye plants can see some items on the floor, they will eat them and store them inside of the lure plant bulb. And while the item is inside of the lure plant bulb, the lure plant bulb will digest one item every once in a while. Which means if you see a lure plant at your base gobbling up your items, kill it immediately so that it doesn't digest any of your items. But luckily there is a way to avoid this danger. Lure plants cannot spawn and eye bulbs cannot grow on turf that isn't natural or rocky turf. So stuff like checkered flooring, carpeted flooring, and all of those turfs are what we use to turf out our base. And as you can see, I planted the eye bulb in the middle of my base. Since the eye bulbs can't grow in a radius around the lure plant, since the turf won't allow it, the lure plant instead will grow eye bulbs outside of my base. Now this kind of acts as hound protection, since when the hounds spawn, if they run past the eye balls, they will get attacked, and that distracts the hounds from you. And they also have another use in summer, which is actually really good, but I'll explain it when we get to summer. So here's a great example example of finding the Lunar Island. Right here, I'm looking at the map and it's really clear where the where the Lunar Island is. The map is kind of one big semicircle at the moment, so it's very obvious that the, that the Lunar Island is the other part of the semicircle out to sea. Now sometimes it's harder to find the Lunar Island, but in general, look for a donut shape in the map, except some of the donut is missing. As if someone took a bite out of the map and then dragged it out to sea and that's the Lunar Island. So I built a think tank, which is like a science machine, but for sea stuff, and I built a boat, a paddle, and a lightning rod. Now in my opinion I don't think boat sails are worth making since they're so expensive and they're really annoying to control because if you make sails that means you need an anchor so instead make one boat make an oar and make some boat patches just in case you crash or your boat gets damaged too much. Also pre-craft a lightning rod so we can put that on the boat since if lightning strikes the boat it sets fire and then that takes damage and then the boat will sink. Now here I am at the edge of the map where I think the Luna Island is, place down the boat, put down a lightning rod and we're gonna start paddling. Now you'll notice that this paddle that you make with one log is extremely weak. You move really slowly while using it. So that's why our first goal is to keep rowing until we see a driftwood piece. And then I find a driftwood piece and then we Head straight back to the base. Bring is this a Malbatross spawner? I'm not killing Malbatross on the Manoob survival world. I'm not doing it. Okay, we found a Malbatross spawner. <laughs> That's funny. We're not killing a Malbatross. Oh my goodness, and Malbatross is just here. You know how in all of my speedruns, I always struggle to find this boss. Then on the world where I don't want to kill the boss, I find it easily, of course. Anyway, this is a boss. We're not gonna kill it because we don't need to, and we're not geared up for it. At the think tank, we can turn this driftwood piece into a driftwood ore. Now, driftwood ore is substantially faster than a normal wooden ore, so it's absolutely worth just making it. And these driftwood pieces can spawn all over the ocean, and you can find them on the lunar island. So now that I've prototyped it, I can make these whenever I want. So be careful while you're sailing. Here I bashed into a rock. Luckily I didn't bash into it very fast because if I bashed into it fast it would punch a hole in my boat which would slowly kill my boat over time. But to plug up punctures in your boat just use a boat patch on the leak and that'll fix it up. That's why we made boat patches. And then we found some cookie cutters. Now these things try to drill a hole in your boat so as soon as they land on your boat just hit them. Two hits with the dark sword will kill them and they're very easy monster meat. They also drop cookie cutter shells which you can use to make a helmet but we're not going to be using those 
those cookie cutter shells this run. Now, as you can see, I am strategically bashing into these salt pillars. Each time you do that, it will break them, and but if you do it too fast, it will bust a hole in your boat. So the proper way you can do it is you can just mine them with a pickaxe. Then I'm picking up the salt crystals because these salt crystals make something very good later on. We need 10 of them. So you know how I said that I thought I knew where the Lunar Island was? Um, yeah, it's not here. Because it's not where I initially thought it was, I looked at the map again, and you can tell top right edge of both the mosaic and the swamp biome have very clean and straight cuts going through them. And it kind of looks like a donut. So I'm going to head over there because at the time I thought that was the most likely next position of where the Lunar Island could be. But then this happened. Oh, there's two of them. Okay, I have to be kind of careful. I mean, or I can just like... Oh dear. Uh, this is potentially not good. Hmm. Ooh, that was close. This is why you should bring pink skin. Uh, I'm gonna just get rid of rid of Wavy. I'm just getting rid of Wavy. And I'll wait for daytime to deal with these two. Okay, that guy despawned. It's okay now. That was genuinely close. Good thing I had food on me. Two of them made it kind of complicated, but otherwise they're kind of easy to kite. Just bait out an attack. Get two or three hits in. Okay. Whoo-wee! Alright, let's get to Luna Island so that I can make some more log suits. <laughs> Wavy Jones likes to mess with your boat. So what he would do is he would pop off the boat patch, causing my boat to take a lot of damage. Wavy Jones will appear at the edge of your boat, and you have to scare him away three times, and then he won't come back for that night. And that was the first legitimate situation where I thought I was going to die. Anyway, my prediction was right. We found the Lunar Island, so let's jump on the Lunar Island and... <laughs> and chop down some trees to make a couple of log suits so that we have armor. So that entire situation has taught us the importance of armor because taking all of the damage directly to your health means you have to chug lots of food and you can die very easily. Ah uh, yes, the reason we came to the Lunar Island, stone fruit bushes. It's a very popular strat to rush the Lunar Island in autumn to get stone fruit bushes because these bad boys grow three fruit, three stone fruit, and you can mine them or blow them up with gunpowder to get what's inside. And what's inside is a 65% chance at a stone fruit, which counts as a vegetable, and it's basically the same as a carrot, except it spoils in three days. But you can counteract this by not mining the stone fruit until you actually want the vegetable. Then you have a 33% chance of just getting a rock, and you have a 1% chance at getting a stone fruit sapling. This sapling you can plant to make another stone fruit bush. And stone fruit bushes planted from a sapling will never need to be fertilized. But since we're stealing these saplings from the Lunar Island, once we replant them, we will, we will need to fertilize them. I'm also going to pick up all of this beached bull kelp. You can use it as like a bad weapon, which you probably shouldn't do, but a better use for it is planting it along the shoreline near your base, because when you do that, every few days it, it will grow a kelp. This is bad to eat on its own. You can dry it as a pretty good sanity food on a drying rack, but we're not going to do that either. It counts as a vegetable in a crock pot, so every few days you can just get some free vegetables via the bull kelp. And both the bull kelp and stone fruit bushes also grow during winter, whereas some other plants don't. Now I'm doing this for demonstration purposes, but what you can do, there are three altar pieces on the Lunar Island, and if you mine them out of their prisons and then put them inside of a celestial fissure, they form a new crafting station, except you can't move it, so you have to come back to the island every time you want to craft something from the crafting station. There are two particularly good things that you can craft from this crafting station. One is the Moonglass Axe. This is an axe with less durability than a normal axe, but it also cuts down trees faster. But most importantly, the Glass Cutter. This Glass Cutter does the same damage as a Dark Sword, and all you need is one plank and six moon shards. Moon shards are renewed but they're pretty slow. You have to put a bath bomb in the little pools you see around the Lunar Island, and then on a full moon, those pools will turn into five moon glass, which you can mine. But like I said, this is for demonstration purposes, so this is only really useful if you don't like to be insane, so you don't get shadow creatures, therefore you don't get a lot of nightmare fuel, therefore you cannot make dark swords. But I would still recommend learning to fight nightmare creatures for the nightmare fuel so that you can make a lot of dark swords. And now that we've plundered the entire Lunar Island, we're gonna swiftly paddle our booties back to the base, and we're gonna plan all of that bull kelp and all of the stone fruit bushes. What is it? Full moon? What the? <gasps> the pigs! The full moon is out and the pigs have turned into were pigs. Now this is one of the reasons we built, built this pig farm. Since there is pig skin inside of that little enclosure we built, 
all of the werepigs are distracted trying to get that, so we can kill them one at a time. Now killing werepigs is pretty awkward because since they always prioritize trying to get food rather than attacking you back, but as soon as you go to attack them, sometimes they'll just turn around and hit you. But from testing, if you just attack them and st don't stop attacking them, sometimes you can stun lock them, meaning they'll never hit you back, because they're stuck in their stagger animation. And the reason why werepigs are so good is because they will always drop one pig skin and two meat, which is enough for a hand bat. And now there is a hound wave coming, so let's test out our, no our new lure plant defense. So as you can see, the eye bulbs do a good job at distracting the hounds, uh, un unless the hounds come from the other side of the base, in which case they don't touch the eye bulbs. But if you don't feel like fighting the hounds, you can just run around the eye bulbs and they'll attack the eye bulbs. And then once all the hounds are gone, the eye bulbs might have eaten some of the monster meat. So then just destroy the actual meat bulb itself and it will give you back the monster meat that it ate. Now using a blue gem, 10 salt crystals that we got earlier, and a cut stone, we can make a salt box. The salt box can only store food that is able to be cooked but is raw, and it keeps it fresh for 4 times longer, whereas a fridge can store everything but only keeps it fresh for 2 times longer. I didn't actually show you this yet, but when your sanity isn't full, these hands can reach towards your campfire and steal some of the light. You can actually chase them back to where they spawned with a, with a light source and then they will despawn. It's time we shave that mag magnificent beard for some beard hair. And I should have shown you this earlier, which I'm only just now realizing, but we can make a meat effigy with this. And when you make a meat effigy, you'll see a little icon appear next to your health bar. And what this does is if you die and you're attuned to the meat effigy, instead of, instead of dying and you can't revive yourself, you can press a button, then you're able to be resurrected by the meat effigy. So you teleport back to wherever the meat effigy is and the meat effigy gets destroyed. So you know, just in case you die, build yourself one of these near your base. And also, if you're not playing as Wilson, beard hair might be a little bit harder to get, but an easy way to get beard hair, drop your sanity until your until your bunny men turn into beard lords, which just bunny men except they have black fur. And when you kill these ones, they drop monster meat and two beard hair. Now, I didn't mention this tip before winter, but this is a good winter tip. If you feed a pig four monster meat, it will turn into a were pig. Were pigs will eat everything, whereas normal pigs will eventually fill up their stomachs, they'll stop eating. And every time a pig or a were pig eats a non meat item, they'll produce one manure. So I fed this were pig some kelp fronds so that I could get some easy manure. Now, this is particularly good for winter because you could go into the caves, grab like 80 light bulbs, and feed all of them to a were pig. That's 80 manure, that will keep your fire pit lit for the entire winter. <laughs> I don't want to die in this frog, you know? Look, what the? Eh? What what happened here? Oh my goodness, that baby beeflo just died to a bee. These foolish beeflo, whatever, I'll loot it up. Because both of the mobs are aggressive during spring. Oh no, another baby just died. I can hear them. They're not running from the bees. Whatever, I'm gonna loot it up. <laughs> Alright, I need to give one of you a hat. Thank you. That's, that is all. Goodbye. Summer is nearly here, and you know how I said you needed to kill those moose goose for five feathers? It's to make a luxury fan. So with five feathers, two reeds, and two rope, you can make a luxury fan. Now what this does, there's an option on it to wave it around, and what that does, it puts out any fires close to you, but more importantly, it lowers your temperature dramatically. The hell? Are those frogs falling from the sky? Oh, it must be a frog raid! So frog rain is an event unique to spring, uh, so when the rain gets heavy, there's a chance that frogs can start falling from the sky. Now, unfortunately, I already killed all of the moose goose in my world. If a frog rain starts happening, a very good strategy is just go to a moose goose. Frogs and moose goose are naturally aggressive, so they'll attack each other. The frogs will usually take out the moose goose and all of the babies. So all you have to do is sit back and watch. I already killed all the moose goose in this world, so instead I'm letting the lure plants try to take care of the frogs. So if you don't know, if you want to get rid of these frogs in your base, all you have to do is run far away to unload that area, and as soon as the area gets unloaded, the frogs will just despawn. Oh goodness, it's so bright! So the frog rain uh, hasn't, hasn't actually stopped, but summer has started. Day 56 is the start of summer. Summer and winter are both 15 days long, and so let's talk about summer. The temperature of the world goes up, so if you have no form of protection, you will overheat. And if you overheat, you take damage and then you might die. So, you've used the eyebrella for spring, you're also going to use the eyebrella for summer. The eyebrella offers the biggest amount of insulation from the sun in the game. So it means that your temperature will go up slower when compared to if you weren't wearing the eyebrella. So a perfectly good strategy is just carrying around the eyebrella and a luxury fan. And then when you start overheating, just wave the 
luxury fan and that'll drop your temperature. And you won't even use the entire luxury fan in one summer. One luxury fan will keep you cool for about one and a half summers. But another good strategy, which is one that I used to use, is by making two thermal stones and putting both of them in your fridge. This cools your thermal stones down. And then you pull out one of the thermal stones to stay cool. And then once that thermal stone gets too hot, you put that one back in the fridge and take out the other one that's cold. The only downside to this strategy is you need to be near a fridge, otherwise you can't swap out. But the most basic form of cooling down, and I wouldn't recommend it, is using nitro and grass to make an endothermic fire, which is a fire which cools you down rather than warms you up. But you would need a lot of these to survive your summer, and an endothermic fire pit is kind of finicky to use because we have a flingomatic inside the base which would put out the fire. So I jumped through the wormhole to get rid of the frogs and- uh, What is this? Is this a boss? I thought I wasn't gonna fight bosses! So I didn't actually mean to spawn this boss, but um, I did by accident because I was doing some farming. So after day 35, this guy will spawn if you're growing a lot of crops. But luckily he doesn't have a lot of health, so just put on some armor and just keep hitting him until he dies. And he drops a friendly fruit fly. This fruit fly will tend to your crops, so now you don't need to talk to any of your crops yourself. So one other thing about summer that I didn't tell you, there will be random wildfires around your world. Let me make these wildfires a little bit less scary by explaining how they work. So a wildfire is an event which happens which, which chooses a structure, object, or something on the floor that's flammable to catch fire randomly because the world is too hot. Now fires in this game spread very fast, so even with the luxury fan it might not be enough to put out the fire, so that's why we have a flingomatic in the middle of our base, because it will easily put out any and all fires. But one sneaky trick about the wildfires, no wildfires happen in the first two and the last two days of summer, because the world isn't hot enough yet. As well as wildfires don't happen during dusk and night of summer, only during the daytime. But also wildfires will prioritize certain items over, over others, and the highest priority target for wildfires are lure plant bulbs. So if you plant a lure plant inside your base inside of the flingomatic range, when a wildfire happens around your base it will always target those lure plant bulbs. This way you can redirect all the wildfires to your lure plant bulbs which will then get put out by the flingomatic rather than setting fire to other parts of your base. So now I went to the oasis desert and look at this. During summer there's a sandstorm in this desert. Now because of the sandstorm there's no wildfires here but also your movement is restricted unless you can get your hands on some desert goggles. The desert goggles themselves only require pigskin and gold, but unlocking the recipe for the desert goggles on the other hand is a very different matter. So every time you fish from the oasis lake, you can get either a fish or a package. And from the package, you have a very small chance at getting the fashion goggles blueprint. So look at that, I got a fashion goggles real quick. And then uh, then you need one more blueprint called the desert goggles blueprint. I'm just gonna rip the bandaid off and tell you, I sat here fishing for two or three days and I didn't get the, uh, I didn't get the desert goggles blueprint blueprint and I didn't feel like fishing for the entire summer. Uh oh, a hound attack. So since it is summer, instead of getting ice hounds, we get fire hounds. Fire hounds, when they die, they explode into flames and obviously you don't want to stay close to the flames, otherwise you take fire damage. This is also another reason why we have a flingomatic in our base, since if we have a hound attack, <laughs> We have a flingomatic in case any firehound sets anything on fire. Also during the summer, both deserts cactus will have cactus flowers on them. So if you want to pick cactus, now is a good time since you get extra cactus flowers which restore health and sanity and hunger. So let's see what's in my inventory. We have two log suits and three and a half football helmets. That's because we're about to fight the summer boss. Now the summer boss is stationary inside of the oasis desert. Now since I don't have the desert goggles, first of all, I can't really see. And second of all, my movement speed is really slow. So I would highly recommend just getting the, the desert goggles. You can do the summer boss without the desert goggles. You might just take a little bit more damage as we're about to see. So I pre-built an endothermic fire because the way to start the fight with this boss is you have to feed it a cool thermal stone or a cold thermal stone. So I also brought some manure to feed to the fire and once the stone is very cold, feed it to Antlion and then the fight starts. Now Antlion summons spikes from under you. You can dodge these spikes if you like barely move. So as you can see, I'm dodging them. But when Antlion gets to low HP, he starts attacking fast so you can deliver a lot of damage. As you can see, my health is dropping quite fast. And you kind of have to keep attacking him because if you stop attacking, he will start eating rocks, which heals him. Now I am taking quite a bit of damage here, but I brought some pierogies to heal up. Because he creates sand castles around his arena to trap you in, after a certain amount of time, they will collapse and he will resummon them, which gives you a little bit of time to breathe. But this boss doesn't have a lot of HP, so eventually he goes down. Now his drops aren't particularly good if you're a solo player. So then why did we kill him? 
Well, since he's the summon boss and I wanted to teach you how to kill all of the seasonal bosses, but also I'll show you what happens if you don't kill him. If you don't kill him, after a certain amount of time, and it will happen multiple times per summer unless you kill Antlion, Antlion makes big holes in the ground and wherever the holes appear, it destroys any structure on top of it, including your, some of your base. And he spawns multiple of them and the older your world is, the more of him he spawns. And these little sinkholes take like more than 20 days to get rid of. So if there's one in your base, you can't build on that little spot for at least 20 days. Days. Now I won't lie, when I was a noob and Antline would attack my base like that, there's a really long warning so you can just run far away from your base to make sure it doesn't break anything. Now there's one crucial thing that we haven't even touched on yet. So we're gonna grab all of our food, pigskin, rope, pickaxes and a hammer because we are going to the ruins. Now the ruins is probably one of the most dangerous places in the game. There's very high rewards there. In fact, in my boss runs I always go to the ruins in the first autumn just because the items you can get are so powerful. Now it's also very very common practice for people to just live in the caves during summer. The caves has a slightly lower temperature than the surface all year round, including summer. So in the caves, the temperature is low enough so that you will never overheat. I'm not going to go too in depth in how to find the ruins in this guide, but in general, find the muddy biome and then once you find the muddy biome which has a lot of light bulbs in it and maybe some glow berries, just run around the edge of it until you find some lichen. Lichen is a blue fungal looking plant and that means you found the wild biomes which is always in front of the ruins. Now be very careful because down here there is nightmare phases, much like the day and night cycle on the surface. There is the calm phase which is normal, the warning phase where you'll see some nightmare fissures open up a little bit but nothing will come from them yet. And then the nightmare phase, during the nightmare phase all hell breaks loose. All of the nightmare lights in the ruins will open up and all of them can spawn two shadow creatures each. Which means you could have a whole horde of shadow creatures chasing you if you're not careful. The monkeys that you find at the entrance of the ruins turn into shadow monkeys, which are extremely aggressive and there's a lot of them. And so they can easily stun lock you. So because you're a beginner, if the nightmare phase is started, and you can tell, because if you look at all the nightmare fissures, if they're opened up really wide, that means the nightmare phase is happening. I would wait for them to be fully closed and then head into the ruins to explore. But once you're inside the actual ruins and you're past all the monkeys, then the danger level gets kind of consistent whether or not it's a nightmare phase. Now someone in my Twitch chat said that I should probably use moggles because they're very beginner friendly and they're right. So rather than using a minor hat, we're going to kill a depth worm, which hit really hard so make sure you dodge them. But they're pretty easy to dodge since their attacks are very slow and they have a huge wind up. Because moggles basically give you night vision, but they require one glowberry and the only way to get glowberries is by killing a depth worm. So I killed two of them and then we're going to head back to the surface to make some moggles. Moggles do require two mole worms, but you can easily find some mole worms in the same forest as the pig king. You can drop some flint or any rock on the floor to make them surface, then hit them with a hammer which will stun them and will allow you to pick them up. Using two mole worms, two electrical doodads, and a glowberry. Now you should use these moggles sparingly since the only way to recharge them is with glowberries and lesser glowberries. Lesser glowberries you can just pick but glowberries are from depth worms. Now I won't lie, even though I made these for demonstration purposes, I barely used them, but they're definitely nice to use if you don't know the layout of the ruins since you can see more. Now the way I would recommend you use the mo the moggles is to wear them for a few seconds so that you can see any en enemies coming and then take them back off and just use your lantern for permanent light. So we do have plenty of pierogi because I turned all of my food into pierogi beforehand. So you could kill the clockworks assuming you have enough armor, but it's really not worth it. I did it here for demonstration purposes. If I was truly trying to loot the ruins, I wouldn't bother with all the clockworks. The clockworks don't get you a lot of loot and it takes a lot of time to deal with them, as in kill them and you take a lot of damage from them and you could potentially die. You can you can loot like the majority of the ruins without ever getting into combat. So that's what I would recommend, but you can fight if you want since we have tons of food and armor. And because you're a beginner, I wouldn't worry about trying to dodge the rooks or the bishops and make sure you eat when you drop to low health. Now, one key tip for the ruins and has saved me count countless times is always have extra armor in your inventory. So if you get into a sticky situation and your armor breaks, your character will automatically put on your new piece of armor. That way you don't have to stop and awkwardly make a new helmet while you're being attacked. So make sure you're always wearing some armor and you have extra armor of the same type in your inventory. Otherwise, once you've killed, <laughs> once you've cleared the area of clockworks, you can hammer these broken clockworks. They do have a small chance of spawning another clockwork, but most of the time they won't spawn a clockwork and you'll just get frazzled wires, which you can give to Pig King for gold. You'll get gears, which are always good, and you have the small chance of getting some gems and some thorsite. Now here's a good example of what the ruins looks like during the nightmare phase. You can see to the top right, there is a nightmare light fully open 
meaning up to two shadow creatures will spawn from it. My biggest tip during the nightmare phase inside the ruins, don't be near more than two nightmare lights. Because if you're like next to five nightmare lights, that's potentially five or even ten shadow creatures that are going to be chasing you. So you can see here there's two nightmare lights and I'm dealing with four shadow creatures, which is kind of handleable. So if you do find yourself in a situation like this when there's two nightmare lights, as soon as you see a shadow creature, just kill it. Because it does take the nightmare lights like 30 seconds or so to spawn both two shadow creatures. So if you kill the first one you see as soon as possible, you won't have multiple on you, you'll only have one on you at a time. Now this is the real reason we're here. See these Thulsite statues? You can mine these and you will get a Thulsite, sometimes two Thulsite, a kind of gem or nightmare fuel. You can tell what kind of gem is inside the statue because if you just look closely, you can see the gem socketed inside the statue. Now some of the statues don't have any gems and that means it will drop nightmare fuel. The statues change what they're holding when, ni when the nightmare phase ends. So if there's a statue with no gems in it, you can not mine it and just wait for the nightmare phase to end and then it might get a gem in it. Also, as you saw there, I mined that statue and a shadow creature came out of it. So during the nightmare phase, when you mine a statue, sometimes shadow creatures can come out of the statues. Otherwise, you're going to want to mine every single statue that you see because Thulsite is the main thing we want. Now in this room, it looks quite alluring with eight statues, but there are two bishops in the bottom right corner of this room. This means that you could mine six out of the eight statues without aggroing the bishops. But since we have the food and armor, we're going to take out the bishops so that we can mine all eight of the statues. And hey, look at this. I even have a helpful little rook running over the statues and walls for me. Speaking of the rook, when he rams into any NPC, he deals 200 damage, which is kind of nuts. So you could manipulate the rooks into damaging the bishops if you move out of the way at the last second. You can bait rooks into running into these objects to destroy the objects for you, but usually it's not worth the time and you may as well just hammer or pickaxe the objects yourself. Also, you can hammer Thulsite walls for Thulsite fragments. Six Thulsite fragments is the same as one Thulsite, but I wouldn't recommend it because it uses up your hammer quite a lot for not a big reward. So here I made an extra backpack, but I left it on the floor. That's because I'm kind of running out of inventory space. So I decided I'm gonna store my gems in this backup backpack because I don't really want to leave the gems on the floor because if an earthquake happens and then a rock falls on my gems, it will destroy all of my gems. Whereas if a rock falls on my backpack, it doesn't matter. As an example of why moguls are good, here with the moguls I can see that a bishop is chasing me and I could tell the second that it stopped chasing me and then I put my football helmet back on. But otherwise make sure you have armor on because you know, getting hit for 100% damage really hurts. Now you'll notice my weapon of choice here is dark swords since I can just craft them on the go as I require more. And because I'm doing a lot of fighting, it wouldn't be very good to bring down a bunch of weapons because it would take up so much inventory space. So instead I bring one dark sword with the ingredients to make more. Now, if you don't have nightmare fuel or living logs so you can't make dark swords, I would recommend making a handbat and coming down with that handbat, but also bringing with you the ingredients to make another handbat when you're like halfway through your trip. So when it gets stale and the damage isn't very good, you can just make a new one. Now, in this scenario, I dropped my lantern, yet I still needed light. So what you can do is switch to your armor right before you're about to get hit, otherwise you can just put your moguls or your miner hat on. Now, I would only recommend this if you're confident about your timing. Now, as you can see there, there are a... There are way too many nightmare lights over there, and so now there are a bunch of shadow creatures chasing me. If you're ever being chased by a big amount of enemies, the best option is just to run, because eventually they'll de-aggro and shadow creatures have a chance at despawning. I had three terror beaks and a crawling horror and a clockwork rook. So I didn't feel like dealing with all of that, so I ran away. Also with nightmare creatures, terror beaks are a lot faster and hit harder than the crawling horrors, so you can run away to separate the terror beaks from the crawling horrors, and that way you can deal with them separately. So this could be a waste of gears, but I wanted to just show you you can do it. For the cost of three gears, you can repair a broken clockwork to get an allied clockwork. So that rook is my friend, and whatever I attack, he will attack. But again, it costs three gears, so don't spend all of your gears on it, but it's something kind of fun you can do. Let's take a little look. Whoa, look at all the gems I've collected. Now the gems that we really want is, is two yellow gems and a green gem, but we still only have one yellow gem, so I still want another one. And now we are entering the labyrinth. The labyrinth is a maze which has spider webs all over it and somewhere inside the labyrinth is the Agent Guardian. The Agent Guardian is basically a clockwork rook except he's more of a minotaur than a rook but otherwise he moves faster, he does 100 unarmored damage which means even if I'm wearing a football helmet he will still deal 20 damage and he attacks pretty fast and he has 10,000 HP. So, so if you're going to kill Agent Guardian you probably don't want to tank him although if you are going to tank Agent Guardian you will need 3 marbles 
suits and six football helmets. But as you can see, I don't have any of that. I only have a few football helmets. So because you're a beginner, you're gonna cheese the Agent Guardian. What does cheese mean? I didn't know what the term cheese meant either until I played this game. Cheesing a boss means killing a boss in a backhanded manner that's like kind of cheating but it's in the game. And we'll, we'll get how to cheese him in a bit. First, we're opening a bunch of ornate chests. These ornate chests are pretty good. They can have anything ranging from a bat bat, which is a weapon that heals you, to gems or even thule sight and nightmare fuel. But as you can see, these spiders can be quite the issue if you're not paying attention. Like any other spider web, if you just walk on the edge of the spider web, you won't trigger any spiders to, to come down. This makes the labyrinth pretty damn safe as long as you take your time and don't trigger spiders. But sometimes when you open chests, it will trigger spiders to come down. So if that happens, just run away. These depth dwelling spiders are basically the same as spider warriors on the surface. Anyway, I have entered Ancient Guardian's arena. You can tell because it's a big bit of muddy turf. And I'm gonna let live commentary to Jakey talk for a bit. Okay, so you can cheese him with graves. I could cheese him with these two graves right here. But, um, let me see. Because sometimes graves don't always spawn. Um, oh, let me, like, not be insane real quick. So there's not always graves that can spawn, so I'm going to cheese him using the pillar, I think. Oh wait, let me have him run over the walls. Agent guarded, you're low on healing? Yeah, I just... Just don't get hit, forehead. Alright. So we're going to do... Oh, I can't hear him. There he is. So... This should work. <laughs> Watch, this just doesn't work and I just get, I'm about to get absolutely obliterated. So, if I stand here... I might initially get hit, but I should be safe now. As long as you keep hitting him... No, there's a bishop. Why is the bishop attacking me? Spiders, save me! Yes, good spiders. So, as long as you keep hitting him, you're fine. Oh no, there's a shadow creature. Hmm. I should be fine. He should die relatively fast. Oh, there's two shadow creatures now. Okay, I'm tanking one Agent Guardian. Oh, I might die! Oh, ah. I cannot take another hit. Stupid shadow creatures. And my heart is not pounding. <laughs> it might be worth. It might be worth carrying. I might go through the maze a little bit more <laughs> to get a bat bat. Uh, I can't take a hit from anything though. Like, I'm such low health, 31. I have a, I have an extra helmet in my inventory, so that's okay. But, like, the damage I take through the helmet is bad. I really want a bat bat. Let me make an extra helmet, just to be sure. Dude, I can't believe shadow creatures... I purposely went sane so that shadow creatures wouldn't spawn. Then two of them spawned. So then I, I had to, like, push Ancient Guardian to get him out of the way so that I could leave. I even said in my head, I was like, hmm, I should have made a lazy explorer beforehand. Because then if that happened, I could teleport out of the safe spot so that like, I could deal with the shadow creatures. So like, if you're sane, you can do that cheese pretty easily. Also, when you're cheesing him like this, wait for him to stop charging. Then make sure to step back. Otherwise, you just have to keep hitting him. Otherwise, it, his charge attack actually has a longer it has a longer range than his melee attack. So that's why he's charging at me, because he can't reach me with his melee attack. Wait, how are you not dead? I've unloaded so many Dark Swords into you. What the heck? It should take- There we go, finally. We did it. And because I'm low health... 
We're just gonna... Ooh, should I? No, we can make a houndius. I got a deer claw. So after I momentarily turned into an owl, I got myself a lazy explorer from Ancient Guardian. So Ancient Guardian's chest can give you a bunch of things. Typically, it will give you some armor or full sight. It can give you a magic staff, like a Starcaller staff, or a lazy explorer. And I was debating whether or not to eat the Ancient Guardian horn, since it does heal you for 40 health. But I'll be fine, I'm sure. So the only thing that went wrong with that cheese is I went insane, which meant there were shadow creatures attacking me. So if you're going to do that cheese, use a hand bat so that you don't have a sanity drain from the Dark Swords, or or bring some sanity food for you just for that cheese. Now there is a full pseudoscience sedation somewhere in the ruins but I didn't find it nor do I have the HP to find it so instead I repaired this broken one and I start crafting. The difference between a broken science station and a repaired one is that the repaired one you can make some more recipes out. So what am I gonna craft? I'm gonna craft one magiluminescence which is an amulet you can wear which gives you light and it gives you a speed bonus but it does take up your body slot. And I do want to make a star cooler staff which summons a dwarf star which basically lights up your entire screen for two and a half days and it provides heat so you know it's very good for winter but unluckily I don't have a second yellow gem but before making any of that we're gonna make a construction amulet because a construction amulet while you wear it halves all of the crafting costs but it only has five uses so we can craft the construction amulet and then use the construction amulet to make something like a star cooler staff so rather than needing two yellow gems I only need one what's this a lazy explorer so even though I just got one from the ancient guardian I'm gonna make a lazy explorer explorer as well and what this requires is just the walking cane and two orange gems and some nightmare fuel and it gives you the same speed bonus as the walking cane but it also allows you to teleport but it only has 20 uses and each time you use it it costs some sanity and last but not least some thulcite crowns I'm gonna spend the rest of my spare thulcite on these thulcite crowns they give you 90% damage reduction which is a, which is a little bit better than a football helmet and when you get hit while wearing one you have a chance of the crown making an invincibility bubble, bubble which absorbs a 100% of damage and it stops you from being staggered whenever you get hit. This is helpful because while wearing a crown, you can no longer be stun locked to death. So you know how I said it, I only had one yellow gem. I got extra greedy and this H and this statue looks like it has a yellow gem. So I quickly ran back to the station to make myself a star cooler staff with this yellow gem and then we're heading back to the surface because it is day 70 and summer is nearly over. Oh, home sweet home. After being in the ruins for like an entire season, it's quite a relief to get back to the base out of all the craziness. So good job. It's Day 71, you have survived an entire Don't Starve Together year. Day 71 is the start of your second autumn. But wait, this, the video hasn't ended yet. What does that mean? Well, it's because we have one more seasonal boss to see. And I have a few things to show you. So this is, so this is what a Star Cooler staff does. It costs some sanity to use, but it summons a staff and you can use the staff 20 times before it breaks. You can cook on it, it can warm you up, but also be careful because if you drop something flammable near it, it can set things on fire. And oh boy, would you look at the time. Day 71 is also a full moon. So we're gonna farm some wear pigs for some pigskin and meat. Not only is this renewable pigskin, but it also gets you some meat for whatever you wanna make. And during the full moon, I put nine pieces of nightmare fuel inside of Chester. You need to put one nightmare fuel into each one of his slots, and then on a full moon, he will turn into Shadow Chester. Shadow Chester simply has three more inventory spots, and that's it. You can also do the same thing, but with blue gems, and you can turn him into Ice Chester. And that way, Chester turns into basically a portable fridge, meaning you can cool thermal stones in him for summer, which is a pretty good strategy, but the other strategies I mentioned are cheaper and better, so that's why I didn't mention it till just now. Now, I'm planting my trees again. I wonder why. Maybe it's because the next seasonal boss is really good at chopping down trees. Hmm, I don't know. And here's the Magiluminescent in action. As you can see, I'm wearing the Magiluminescence and it's providing a small area of light around me and it makes me move a little bit faster. But you do need to refuel it with Nightmare Fuel, otherwise if it hits 0% it will break. Now I gathered a whole stack which is 40 Frazzled Wires from the ruins. So this 40 Frazzled Wires is going to get me 200 gold. I'm probably going to be good on gold for a very long time. Remember those stone fruit bushes that I stole from the Luna Island? Well, I'm just going to plant them now. So as you can see, I built a flingamag near my pig farm a while ago. If I use my pigs to defend against hounds, and there was some fire hounds. This way the pig houses won't burn down. And I'm gonna make double use of this flingamatic because it will keep these plants hydrated during summer. Now, like I said, you do need to fertilize these plants since we're planting them new, but that's why we have some rot and some poop from earlier from the wear pigs. What is this? A, a crit? A what? So using one glomagoop and one taffy, I just adopted a glom glom. Wait, well, did you hear that? There was a roar in the background. 
After a few roars, the autumn seasonal boss will spawn. Now you might think, why didn't he spawn in my first season? Well, since it's the start of the game, Beardra won't, won't spawn in your first autumn, but he will spawn in your second autumn. Now Deerclops likes destroying structures. Now Beardra's goal isn't to destroy structures, instead it is to eat all the food he can. So when he spawns, he will just be going around eating the berries off of berry bushes, eating carrots from the ground, and eating any food that you leave on the floor. Do note, if you have any honey or any croc Bot recipes in your inventory that require honey. Beardra can get very mad at you sometimes, it seems kind of inconsistent, but he can become aggressive without you ever attacking him. When Beardra charges, he destroys everything around him, so you can just take him over to a forest and destroy the entire forest and give yourself a whole lot of logs. In fact, this is one of the best, if not the best way to get logs in the game. Since Beardra is so destructive, he can just destroy all the trees in a forest. I won't go into the best way of utilizing Beardra to, to destroy his trees, but very quickly, you want to maximize how long he does his charge attack for like how long he sprints for because his sprint is a whole lot more destructive than him just doing a swipe once every two seconds also if Beagre walks over a tree he doesn't actually make any logs from it whereas if he slices a tree or sprints over it it does chop it down and you do get all the logs but anyway once you feel like you have enough logs Beagre probably would have spawned a bunch of tree guards because of the amount because of the sheer amount of trees that he's knocked down now it does take about three tree guards to kill Beagre but what I'm trying to say is you basically never have to kill Beagre yourself because he'll just kill himself because he'll spawn too many tree guards for him to handle. So that's how I recommend you kill your last seasonal boss. So here's some additional tips. So with the stone fruit bushes, once you harvest them, you'll get a load of stone fruit. If you separate these into stacks of 10 and then drop them all on top of each other, then you can make a gunpowder with one nighter, one rotten egg, and one charcoal. And then if you light that gunpowder on top of the stone fruit, it will blow open all of those stone fruits all at once. The traditional way to open up stone fruits is by mining them, which can take a long time. So there you go, if you didn't know that, that's a good way of opening up stone fruits. After gathering up all that wood, you can make all of the chests that you want. So I'm just going to fill up this little zone with chests so I can store all of my stuff in it. Then I can store all of my weapons and armor up here in these chests. Oh, it's so organized, isn't it nice? Then in this little area here, you can build some drying racks, because why not? And here you could dry meat to turn it into jerky, which gives you sanity, health, and hunger. You can put kelp fronds on here, which dry really fast and they give you some sanity. And then you can accidentally spawn the Lord of the Fruit Flies again, because you know, I was doing some farming. Then I'm sure there's lots of you questioning, Jake, why didn't you make a berry bush farm? Berry bush farms are like okay, but they require a lot of time to set up, and they don't really solve your health issues. They only, they're only good for really making meatballs, but whatever, I'll make one anyway. Then I went ahead and found this strange looking rock, which has the celestial orb in it, and is and is guaranteed to spawn by day 50 in one of the meteor biomes. And with that, you can upgrade your portal. So now, if you wanted, you could switch characters if you use Moonrock Idol on the upgraded portal. And finally, all the berries off the berry bush have grown, and this is what the berry bush farm looks like. This is about 25 berry bushes, and should produce enough food for one or two people, assuming that you make the drumsticks from the turkeys and the berries into meatballs. Now you can see, as soon as the turkey spawned, he immediately went for this little caged off area. Inside there, I dropped a powl cake, which you can make with honey, twigs, and, and acorn. You can also drop berries in there, that works fine too. And then once you're done picking the berries, kill all the turkeys that have spawned and they all and they both drop two drumsticks each. So with just with so with this small berry bush farm, I can make four meatballs. And here is the pigs acting as hound defense in action. As you can see, pigs are naturally aggressive towards hounds, so they'll just attack them. You, there's no need for you to try to de-aggro the hounds, the pigs will just kill them. This time there weren't any fire hounds, but if fire hounds did spawn, the flingomatic is there to put out any fires. So now that you're big and strong and survived a whole year, you can do whatever you want. You could kill Dragonfly, you could kill Celestial Champion. Now this was a beginner's guide, so there is still a whole lot more to come. There is a lot of content that we simply didn't do because this guide was aimed at beginners. So make sure you subscribe because the next guide I'm going to make is for intermediates. And what will we do in this guide? Well, you have to watch it to find out. But anyway, thanks for watching. If I didn't mention any tips that you use in your games, feel free to comment them down below so that other people can see use your tips as well. I think I covered most of the tips for all of the seasons. So this video took ages to make. It's been in the, it's been in the making for like two or three weeks. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the explanations. Have fun with your own games. And uh, yeah, leave a comment, like the video, all that. And I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.